Okay, okay great. All, all set? Yes. All right, here we go. Welcome to the Wednesday, May 24th, 2022 meeting of the Longmeadow School Committee. Just a reminder that all votes while participating remotely must be made by roll call vote. We will start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance, Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, and we are very excited that we have guests with us today. It's been a long time since we've had guests with us, so it's great to see people sitting on the other side of the room. I know at home you might not be able to see everybody right now, but you'll see them later on. Uh, and we're gonna start with the Student Advisory Council. So, Dagan, I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I am the first one on your docket for um, senior events and activities. I know I am not a senior, but I can't wait to speak about them. They're having a great time for the rest of their, you know, their very short-lived for the rest of the year. Um, so, as I said, very short-lived. So the seniors' last day is tomorrow. So, congratulations to our seniors. You've made it through four years of high school, wherever you may go after that. Good luck to you. Um, coming up, they have their senior social, which will be on June 2nd. That's going to be held at Bliss Park, right? At Bliss Park. And then they're also having their award ceremony on the 3rd. That is to recognize any students in areas of academic study, or things like that. Um, prom will be held at the log cabin on June 7th. I have spoken to the president of the senior class. They are currently selling tickets. They're, you know, ticket sales are moving along, looking like they're having a very good prom. Prom is actually very reasonably priced since the class is in such a good financial position. And finally, the graduation obviously will be held at the LHS Stadium at 5 o'clock on June 9th. So after that, they're really free to go. So that, that is really all I have for our seniors at the moment. Uh, I believe we have um, Charles Lee. Charles Lee speaking about spring sports. So Charles is on Zoom. Uh, hello everyone. I will give a brief update on spring athletics. Uh, currently, we are in playoff season, and we still have a few teams that are in it for a chance to win Western Mass and move on to the state championship. Uh, these include both the boys and girls tennis and the cross team, as well as boys baseball. Uh, track and field also have quite a few of the players that will compete in the state championship, which is happening this coming weekend, and that is all from our report today. Thank you. Awesome. And then we will move, I think Charles will move into clubs and activities. Um, I do not see Maddie on Zoom. Do I? No? Okay. She. Yeah. All right, so I will move, I will speak about clubs and activities. Um, so far in Clubs activities as I know, um, a lot of our, obviously our senior activities are happening. And then for clubs, I can speak to the, at least the Model Congress side. So yesterday, there was a very successful um, first, hopefully, of many Model, um, Long Meadow Model Congress sessions. So the, the Long Meadow Model Congress Club, in which I am the president, decided since, since we could not participate in any in-person conferences this year since them were held, a lot of them were held virtually, but that was you know, not of interest of our members. So myself and my executive board and the members of my club said, you know what, why don't we hold one here? What, what's, what's really stopping us from doing so? So we put out some feelers to um, East Long Meadow, to Agawam, to Minichog, and we got some good responses. So um, yesterday we met in emergency session voting on a bill on America's involvement in the crisis in Ukraine. Uh, we had eight, eight participants from East Long Meadow High School, four participants from Agawam High School, and about five from Long Meadow come to Sem A over in the academic wing and spent three hours in speech and debate and um, congressional talkings about you know what, what were we going to do as a nation if we were members of Congress. And, that, and that's all I have to report on clubs and activities, so that should be the end of the Student Advisory Council report. Thank you, Dagan. Any questions or comments for Charles or Dagan? May I? Marty, please. Um, so thank you for the report. It's really informative, as always. And I'm seeing behind you, Dagan, is Mr. Dunkerley, who uh, is nearing the end of his, his career <laughs> here in Longmeadow Public Schools. And uh, he's been a, a great support 
and an advocate for the student council, uh, for the, the advisory committee to the school committee. So uh, I know Mr. Dunkerley is coming up on our agenda a little bit later, but I wanted to make sure that we acknowledge what, a, what great work he does with all the, uh, the student council uh, students. So thank you, Mr. Dunkerley. Yeah. All right. Thank you. More than a golf clap, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, Dagan, thank you, and, and thanks to everybody on the Student Advisory Council. We really appreciate um, all of you keeping us informed um, and having a student voice on the committee. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, correspondence. Nicole? The following correspondence was recorded for the school committee. An email from Wendy Rua received on May 11th, 2022, regarding an MASC Division Five meeting scheduled for June 9th and an email from Ms. Olivia Hickey received on May 12th, 2022, regarding the meeting of May 11th. Thank you very much. We have a recommended motion for approval of minutes. I move that the school committee approve the minutes for the May 11th, 2022 school committee meeting as presented. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, we will move to a vote. Nicole? Yes. Mary? Yes. Gianna? Epstein. Bronwyn? Yes. Susie? Yes. Oh, Jamie, just in time. <laughs> <laughs> Jamie, you get to vote on the minutes. Yes. <laughs> well done. Uh, and yes from me. All right. We move next to visitor comments. And again, just a reminder on visitor comments. Uh, if we do have any visitors who would like to make a comment, make sure that you tell us your name and where you live. Um, and you will have three minutes to make your comment. Uh, and again, make sure that you address uh, anything to me. Um, and we are happy to hear comments that you have. Um, and if you don't want to make a comment, a uh, spoken comment, we are always welcome uh, we always welcome you to email in your comments to the school committee. Is there anybody who would like to make a visitor comment? I am not seeing anyone who would like to make a visitor comment. Okay. We are going to move on to school committee announcements and recognitions of school committee members. Announcements, recognitions. Uh, Gianna. You can go ahead and call first. Nicole. Oh, um, just a big thank you to the um, high school and music department for the most recent Major Works concert. Um, it was really great to see everybody on stage performing and they did a fantastic job. Um, some last minute fill-ins for students um, who jumped in at the last minute to help out and that was very well done and a very enjoyable evening. So thank you to everyone for their time and energy on that. Excellent, yeah, those are always a lot of fun. Gianna. Oh, thank you, Kevin. So. Um, I was going to pull from a from a post that I made about Longmeadow Public Schools, but I'm just going to read it. It's, I'll, I'll, I'll read it quickly just because it's easier that way. Um, and my daughter taught me how to read from my phone. When I'm from <laughs> phone so. um, I do post a lot um, called Points of Light, just things that are inspiring people and, and activities and things that are inspiring. So this was Points of Light on Sunday. Um, the students, parents, families, educators, administrators, partners and members of the Longmeadow Public Schools community and beyond. If you know me, as most of you here know me, um, you know, I love my teams and I'm fiercely loyal to family, friends, colleagues, teammates, and anyone who has shown my family or me love and kindness. I feel blessed to have Longmeadow as one such team where we are surrounded by loving, amazing, inspiring people of all ages. Appreciated LPS, attending and participating in many fun and engaging school and community activities. I am especially grateful for the celebrations of love and life these past two weeks as our LPS community navigates the tragic, uh, tragic loss of one of our precious students. From beautiful choral and instrumental concerts to crazy exciting lacrosse games, I can't even tell you, uh, to creative writings and drawings and impressions magazine, to busy teenagers taking time to say, hi, Mrs. Allentuck, how are you? to students receiving district and state awards and accolades, to cool robotics demonstrations, to brilliant students on a school's match wits, to inspirational celebrations of life, to sunshine and smiles at semi-formals, to friends checking on friends, to thoughtful civics projects, to memorial runs with alumni and runners from around Western Mass, 
to a coach who encouraged those runners this morning, so that was at that memorial run, to run with love and kindness in their hearts, to play music, to pick up a pretty rock that speaks to you, to enjoy the breeze, to celebrate breath and life and togetherness, and to the freshman boys who finished holding hands, to the alumni who finished with his hands in the shape of a heart, to the Long Meadow and the little girls who are always tough competitors who finished with hands clasped in unity and in hope. So just a little shout out to Long Meadow Public Schools and, and beyond. Um, you're just awesome. That was beautiful. Thank you, Jim. Susie. Thank you, yes. I would um, wanted to uh, shout out to the PTO at Blueberry Hill. Um, they hosted the first uh, Blueberry Hill Spring Shuffle on Sunday, and it was a 5K race and a fun run for the kids. And uh, they did it in the extreme heat uh, that we're not used to in May. Um, and uh, had some bounce houses with, with water slides, which was a welcome <laughs> welcome uh, opportunity, but it was just a fun family day. Um, and I just wanted to thank the PTO and, uh, and also the administration at um, Blueberry Hill for, for putting that on and for the, the three uh, staff members who sacrificed themselves in the dunk tank, but it was a good day to do. Um, <laughs> just really grateful for that uh, very nice, day that we had together. Thank you, Susie. Other school committee comments? All right. We are to business with guests. Marty. Sure. Uh, thank you. Uh, so we'll start. We have uh, several guests <coughs> with us this evening. We'll start with uh, folks from Glenbrook. Principal Nicole Allen is continuing uh, effort to showcase projects that illustrate the vision of the graduate. Uh, Nicole Allen is here to proudly represent some civics action projects. So I'll turn it promptly over to Nicole Allen. Welcome, Nicole. Hi, thank you. So we are excited. We have some of our students that actually joined us, which is awesome. So if, is it possible, Marty, for you to show the um, video, the solar panel one first, and then the, the three students that are here, Kayla Hazek and Jordan, will be able to speak a little bit to that? Absolutely. Would you like me to run that now, or do you have any intro for that? Um, Kayla, you do a really good job with the intro to this. Would you like to do the intro for that? <laughs> Kayla, we're having a, a bit of a hard time hearing you. I don't know if it's just us here in the in the meeting room, uh, or it could be everyone. I'm not sure. Shall we go to test it again? Ms. Allen, you want the, uh, the, the solar charger one first? Yeah, that'll kind of just show you what they did and then they can explain if you guys have questions about it um, and about their prototype that they've created. All right, so stand by. Let me cue that up and we'll be right with you. Solar powered phone charge design, or at least the electronic. Oh, 
Stand by, just gotta share the screen. solar-powered phone charge design, or at least the electronics of it, made for our clean energy project for Action Civics. As you can see here, it's made up of a few simple components, first of which is obviously the solar panel, which collects the energy. Next up is the step-down power converter, which controls the output of the voltage, making sure it doesn't fry whoever's phone is plugged in. Lastly, we have the USB ports, which are connected to the step-down power converter and the solar panel. These, of course, are plugging your phone. We hope that this project can educate others on the usefulness of clean energy and quite possibly even make a difference, no matter how small, in the effects that our technology and the technology of our friends, family, and peers has on the environment. We hope that this assists in the fight against climate change and our goal is to preserve the natural world for those who come after us. Thank you so much. Ms. Allen, any uh, follow-up? So when the students had come to me and asked me if it was possible for them to, they, first they showed me the prototype and what they were thinking was to, if there was a way to pilot it at Glenbrook, could we get you know the wood and a couple of things to maybe put two of them around Glenbrook's property uh, just for the public to be able to use. And so they bought these things with their own money. So we went ahead and bought a couple of just a few more of the things that you saw in the video, the solar panel and the other things to have them create a couple more. So basically what I think is a cool idea is that I said, if you know, this could help anybody, not just good for clean energy, just if someone is riding their bike and their phone's dead and they fall off their bike, they could use something like this. Um, if there's a couple of these on, you know, different properties that they could use. So I just thought it was pretty cool for them to come up with an idea on how they could charge phones, um, you know, with the, you know the solar and everything so i don't know if you guys have questions you want to ask them i just thought it was really cool and if they wanted to kind of present to you guys if there was a possibility to create more of these and have them sort of around town if possible any questions so, for oh, i'm sorry yeah, yeah comments yeah. or questions go ahead mary I think this is a really neat idea, especially if they were available just randomly around town, but all the kids knew where they were located. <laughs> um, does it work? Did you charge your phones with it? Uh, yes, we ran my text in school with our iPhone. Yes, it worked. Okay, very cool. Very cool. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Kevin. Um, so amazing, your thought process, your innovation, your just creativity, and thanks for letting them do this, Principal Allen. I, um, you know, m my first thought is, you know, I hope that y'all are eighth graders because my husband runs the robotics <laughs> team here at the high school <laughs> and you need to That's sign shameless. up real fast. <laughs> um, and then my other thought is, you know, uh, have y'all looked into any science fairs or any kind of MIT always has, um, they're always looking for innovation from especially, you know, younger students, uh, middle school and, and high school. So happy to help Principal Allen if you want to maybe think about some, some places to get, this, to get this idea out there. Um, I do have some concerns about liability. Um, and so I'm also happy to kind of talk to you maybe about the process of you know, you could be looking at some patent work. Um, you, you definitely need to be thinking about liability. Um, if any one of these sparks or, you know, I, Kevin's a scientist, but if any one of them, you know, oh, results in any kind of damage <laughs> to the phone or um, I, 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 I think there's just kind of a liability aspect that you need to be thinking about before they, they, before they get put into use. Um, and so again, Principal Allen, I'm happy to talk to you about that. I'm not, I'm not a lawyer either. I, I just used to work for some, so I, I just want to, <laughs> you know, let you know that th there's that process as well. So science fairs, ways to get it out there into the 
into the public view because um, I do think it's incredible um, and also just kind of the 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 legality of it um, in terms of before you actually you know think about getting into it into use even at the school level um, and especially before the public level so all in all amazing sign up for long widow robotics um, <laughs> and principal Allen, please feel free to give me a call Ms. Allen, you care to maybe a time to plug the uh, the civics action fair that that uh, is coming up at Glenbrook? I forget the date. Yeah, that is on June third. It's in the afternoon. As I, and if you believe you guys were all, I, I believe we sent it to you invited. I'm not sure. We'll double check. Um, but you're more than welcome to come. It's the whole afternoon, and I could send the um, flyer out to you. All the kids are going to be presenting theirs, and we are um, inviting all of their families to come and check them out. A lot of good stuff happening. Now you have one other. Uh, you have one other video. Is that correct? Right. Yeah, oh, that sorry. was on deforestation. Okay. So Jamie, you had a comment, question. Oh. No, <clears throat> just just a uh, comment. Yeah, I don't. Uh, Gianna's questions are good ones, but uh, just overall, I think it's a fantastic idea. I could have used this on Saturday, <laughs> Sunday, Monday. Um, I was sitting on a field, I had no place to charge my phone, I walked back to my car and let it run for 15 minutes. <laughs> so having something like this, uh, especially where I happen to be, the last uh, few days would have been would have been wonderful and obviously a heck of a lot more useful than starting up my car and running it. Um, the one thing I would say is um, it looked like it only could charge one phone. If you are going to put them in a place where you know we get by, you know the legality of what Gianna was talking about, um, you know you definitely want to have more than one because I'm assuming you're going to put it somewhere where there's a congregation of people normally. You know maybe two, three number of outlets would be something you would want to consider too, just so more than one person can charge it. So, but I think it's an awesome, awesome idea. Uh, it's pretty impressive and uh, could have used one a day or two ago. So. <laughs> Thanks, Jamie. Uh, Bronwyn's going to. Bronwyn, go ahead. Thanks. Uh, I just wanted to also echo um, what some other people said. This is extremely creative, and um, you guys using your imagination to to help others is very much appreciated. And I'm hoping that this is able. Uh, to somehow take off. I feel like it would be um, an amazing uh, addition and people would really, really appreciate it. So thank you. Thanks, Robert. Okay, Marty, I just, want to, I just want to thank our three students for joining us. I know it's a big deal to get on the school committee meeting and stop what you're doing as a kid at quarter seven to get online. So I just want to thank you guys, Dylan, Kaloha, and Hazek. They, they work so hard on this and I think it's pretty amazing what they're doing. So I wanted to thank you guys publicly um, for joining us and for coming up with such a cool project. So thank you guys. Absolutely, thank you. Okay. So the next video is on deforestation. You'll see four of our students who went to Turner Park to uh, plant some trees, which is pretty cool. And their videos um, is, is the four of them explaining it and then kind of showing you some pictures of um, them planting the trees. All right, stand by, we'll share that now. Okay. Here we go. Well, deforestation is the clearing of forested land with an attempt. We saw the recent increase in local deforestation and thought we should make a change. Throughout history, forests have been cleared to make space for agriculture and animal grazing, which have been able to fill manufacturing infrastructure. We feel deforestation is important because of the recent increase of industrialization, which causes an increase of the release of carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide actually is in the trapping heat, causing a rise in average global temperature. The moon can storage large amounts of atmospheric carbon. Trees filter carbon dioxide out of the air and release oxygen. As forest cover decreases, carbon dioxide filtration, filtration slows, which accelerates as the greenhouse effect. 
The forest station also releases dense concentration, concentrations of carbon, soil, trees, and soil into the atmosphere, further contributing to the greenhouse effect. To try to make a difference in local deforestation, we contacted a member of the tree committee, David Aranetti. He helped us set up a tree planting event on Earth Day. The event turned out to be a huge success in the end of the planning of the tree. In return for David Aranetti's help, we helped him put over 300 tree samplings into bags, bringing it to give out to younger students the next day. Here's some photos from the event. <laughs> Ms. Allen, you want to take the floor? Yes. Yes. I mean, it, it's pretty amazing what the kids are doing. It was tough to pick groups because, you know, we asked Ms. Barr, who's the civics teacher in eighth grade, to help us kind of gather which ones we could show at school committee. But there's just, there were so many kids that are doing so many amazing things. But we, we were just, you know, we're excited that we had two groups that put together, a, you know, because Unfortunately, the presentations aren't until next uh, Friday, so we knew we wouldn't be able to get, and we were signed up for today. So it was great that they were able to put something together for you guys today. And there's the amazing things that are happening, and hopefully some of you guys can come and check some of these things out next Friday afternoon. And a shout out to uh, Mr. Marinelli, our, our tree warden, who's been a great partner uh, to Longmeadow Public Schools for, for decades. And uh, more, I, I appreciate the tie-in between the middle school civics action project and the distribution of the saplings to the elementary school students uh, later on. It, it's just a great community tie-in. So thanks so much for leading that project, Nicole. Yeah, no yeah. problem. Thank you to Ms. Barr. She's, she's doing a great job. And these kids are awesome. They're so into it and get more student buy-in when they're you know doing something that they're passionate about. So it's pretty cool. Questions or comments, Nicole? Um, thank you for sharing this with us. This looks like a really great project too. You guys worked really hard on this and appreciate you taking the time and energy to bring this down to the elementary school as well. Um, just a big thank you to all of the eighth graders who are working hard on their civics action projects and looking forward to seeing more about all of them next Friday. Thank you. Joe. Uh, thanks, Kevin. Principal Allen, did, did, they, all, did they say 300 trees? I don't know if they said, do they say 300? Yes, saplings. 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 They, they put the, the saplings in the bags, in the bags. For, for the kids. Yeah, yeah for and the, then yeah. that's what was yeah. planted by the elementary schools? Yeah, so Mr. Marinelli goes to the elementary schools on Arbor Day or in and around Arbor Day and he distributes uh, little uh, evergreen saplings to students. So and these guys put the saplings in the in the bags. That, that's yeah. a lot that's a lot of saplings so <laughs> thank you for that and, and for helping the environment and just being awesome thank you yeah this is great and I mean we always say that a highlight of any meeting is when we get to hear from kids and we're going to hear from more kids soon uh, but it's wonderful to see the videos and to see the projects that kids are doing and know that you know some of the changes that that have happened in the curriculum um, we can see what's going on and see the kids excited about doing these projects so this is a this is a real treat thank you thank you Ms. Allen appreciate yeah, your time you. all right all right we're continuing with civics action Lumber eighth graders, you guys are free to leave. <laughs> they're, they're good students. They're waiting for direction. <laughs> uh, so uh, next up, this, this is very fortuitous that we have um, some high school students now representing some civic action projects. And 
uh, commendation to the high school administration, the high school staff, the, the social studies department for uh, running with um, the civics action work over the last couple of years. And the projects are becoming, the instructions uh, maturing, the projects are maturing, uh, and it's exciting to uh, have Ms. Snyder. You can start to bring the team up and um, invite you to introduce the team and introduce civics action at Longmeadow High. So thank you. Welcome. All right, so good evening. I'm Lori Snyder. I'm in my 26th year of teaching social studies here at Longmeadow High School, and I'm very excited to update you about um, where the state of action civics right now at LHS in the social studies department. And I have brought, um, this is, will you go ahead and introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Finch Stepanian, I'm a junior. And I'm Tempest Carrizio, I'm also a junior. And I also have two other students who will come up and introduce themselves um, as they fit into our presentation. Um, but um, I have actually representatives from two different blocks who did two different really fantastic projects related to action civics. But before um, I turn the presentation over to them, I thought I would just kind of, because I'm a historian, give you some background, because it's been about three years since we talked about action civics, and I still remember that presentation. So I just prepared a brief presentation so you would have an overview of, um, you know, where, this, where we are with action civics um, in LA, at LHS in the social studies department. So, all right, so, um, Marty, if you would just go ahead and there go. forward. Yeah, there we go. So, the last time I think I was speaking to you was the spring of 2019 where we were talking about a pilot program. We weren't quite sure um, what this was going to look like. And I'm back three years later, ready to tell you that um, the project is really taking off. We still have some work to do, but I'm really proud of the work we've been able to accomplish given the sort of challenges of COVID and remote learning and hybrid learning um, and so on. So 2019, 2020, we piloted sort of a, a four prong approach to action civics. Unfortunately, just as the students were getting ready to take their action, school um, went remote. Um, so that never really um, got off the ground. Last year, we did um, implement action civics, but the challenges of you know, doing this type of work, which is a lot of consensus building, just the remote situation did not really lend itself to that type of discussion. So um, we tried our best, um, and so we came back for the third time this year and uh, spent more time in the summer talking and, and doing work on the program. And I would say at this point, um, the vision of you know, where we want this to go, I think is starting to be implemented and realized. And so given what we've been up against, I'm really proud of the work that teachers have done and my students have done under these um, situations. So next slide. Oh, I'm missing. I'm missing Let's something. See. Is the action hourglass? No, back. Oh, oh, for some reason it's, it's it disappeared. I made it in the packet. Uh, let's see. Okay, well, I'll just talk about it anyway. Right, um, so this past year, we actually fully implemented the six-step advocacy hourglass model, which is the one recommended by the state of Massachusetts. Um, and so our students, so with the hourglass, right, we start with community issues. Um, the students started with more than 21 community issues here in Longmeadow. And they um, chose different issues to research and the purpose of the research um, they were taught how to vet sources, how to use Moodle tools in terms of their bibliography, and um, lateral reading is a really important skill with internet research. So we did a lot of work on that. They did their research. They then wrote persuasive narratives where they then argued that their particular topic should be the one that the class devoted its energy to. So that was a process. Um, after that, we um, so of those 21 community issues, we narrowed down to one focus issue. And that was um, 
really interesting, like watching the students engage, and um, I think it was your class, big time debate um, in that class. Uh, with that, but then once we um, were able to, once they were able to come to consensus on a focus issue, that's when the deeper dive learning really started to happen because when they were researching the first round, they're researching all sorts of different things. One of the things was we don't have a dog park in town, so we have problems. Like if you've been on the forum, you know that dogs in town are a thing. Um, and so students, you know, did this research for that issue. Once we had the focus issue, so in their class it was? Opioid addiction. Opioid addiction and overdose. And for these guys back here, it was um, ableism awareness. They did a whole nother level of research. So we started with um, generating questions. Students watched documentaries. We had guest speakers come in and they drove the questions. Like what do they want to know about this? That led them to um, identify systemic root causes, which is a very important component of action civics. You want to get at what is, um, what is going on right up the stream that's causing the issue. And so in many cases, these are complex community issues. So the systemic root causes are complex and there's multiple um, root causes. So once they were able to um, look at their systemic root causes, they selected a cause that they wanted to try to um, you know, improve, and so they set a goal, okay? So that one, I'm gonna let them talk a little bit more about their projects in particular. They then had to identify targets, right? Who in the community can be a resource to help them meet their goal? And so um, they worked on that. And then finally, their tactic. What can we actually do? What action can we take so that the goal is realized? And so I can tell you, we started this in October, and we just finished last week. So this has been an ongoing project, um, and it's, it's really been phenomenal. OK, all right. Um, yes. Uh, I'm going to let you two talk about your project. Are you OK, okay. with that? Yeah. All right. So you want to start? <laughs> well, you can see so what I have up on the yeah. slide. Yeah, we have um, <laughs> all of the pictures up there, as you can see. Um, we did a lot of planning and we decided that one thing that we could put our like attention towards is overdose and we figured that we would try and spread the word of overdose and how we can help prevent deaths by overdose by getting people trained in Narcan which is a form of naloxone which is a drug that helps counteract a drug overdose it's completely safe even if you're not overdosing on opiates, it cannot harm you. And we had this event, as you can see, on April 30th. Our class, which consists of 22 people, was trained before that, but during the event we had trained a grand total of 25 people. Thank you, Tempest. Okay, and um, I, think, I think what happened is that every other um, page of my presentation oh, no. didn't make it oh, into no. the okay. um, presentation, but just to, you know, their goal, when I was talking about goal, was to increase the number of community members trained in saving lives of those who overdose. Their targets, they partnered with closed community here in town, they worked with Paul McNeil, um, that was a fabulous resource um, for this particular group. They worked with um, Shelley Warren as a substance abuse counselor um, for the schools. Um, we partnered with the LPD um, and we piggybacked on their drug take back day event um, to also, we reached out, the students reached out to them and um, asked if we could also provide Narcan training. And then finally we reached out to Tapestry Health in Springfield and the students advocated and asked Tapestry Health to come in and actually provide the training. And they also provided free um, naloxone kits for any um, community member uh, who happened to get trained that day. And some of their other um, you know, tactics, do you want to talk about? Yeah, so mm -hmm. uh, we made posters that we hung up around the school and I think around town. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, there were a couple. That, um, just to advertise both our event and the drug take back in general. Um, and we also created t-shirts and bracelets, should have worn one of the bracelets, so yes, I pretty cool, um, to give to people for free when they like participated and were trained in how to administer Narcan, um, and free food, and Tempest and I and a few other classmates, we stood 
um, on the edge of the road uh, outside the police department, holding up signs. Screaming just, out into the street. Yeah, whatever people walked by or drove by with windows open, just, hey, want to get Narcan trained? And a surprising amount of people said yes, um, <laughs> which was great. So how many members? 25, 25 members of the community were trained, and then 22 class members, and it was great. It makes a difference. Great, right? And I just want to say, too, the opioid addiction uh, pamphlet in the bottom right, like that was information that Close had, but one of my students, um, Jules Norgren, she redesigned that entire pamphlet so that it was more eye-catching, more user-friendly. Um, so students, um, Tempest designed uh, the t-shirt, and uh, we did not hear back from Tapestry Health until the Thursday before April vacation, and this event was on April 30th. So we hit the ground running on that Tuesday before the event and made a lot of stuff happen, as Dr. O'Shea knows, with last minute phone calls. Um, but um, I was really proud of the work that they, the work that they did, and um, so thank you. All right. Thanks, Chris. All right, and now this is come on up. Do you mind if we ask questions before you? Not at all. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Like that might work a little better. That's okay. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Well, you have, to, <laughs> he had to leave. He told me that before, so he, yes. you know, he had to go. He has another um, commitment, so he was worried about so, the timing. So I wonder if we could. Just to see if anybody had comments or questions on that project before we switch. Nicole. I would love to go. Um, thank you so much for coming and sharing this with us. Um, it's amazing to hear how the process goes um, and how that um, advocacy model has really been a way to move students through that process. And I feel like that, that consensus building and that work is so important and such a really it's part of our, our vision of the graduate to be able to learn to collaborate and work mm -hmm. together in this way is just really um, meaningful and, and useful and for your project in particular congratulations that's absolutely fantastic um, you guys took a really deep dive into something that is really important and kudos for training 47 people is is a real big accomplishment those are a lot of lives that could be saved from that so thank you so much for taking the time to put that together and going through that and just appreciate you guys coming and telling us about it today. Absolutely. John. Yeah, thank you. Thank you again to everybody. But um, I was going to, I'll echo what Nicole was saying about the process. I, I love that y'all are following that process. It's just, you know, that, you know, concrete things that you can tackle. Um, but what I especially loved is what y'all were saying about it's ongoing. We're not going to fix the opioid problem. We're not going to fix the over. But like, you know that you can take steps to help in some way because it's it's huge. But so is 47 people trained in a, in a town that has you know we've we've seen the results of of you know opioid crisis and, and, and overdose. So you know, love the con the you know the process, but especially the concept that y'all know that. You're working towards something. You're not going to be able to fix everything, um, and it's just amazing. So thank you. Absolutely. Any other comments or questions before we move to the next project? Okay. And I want to make sure we get your full slide deck. So give us a second okay. to coordinate that, and then, sure. and as soon as we have that, we'll uh, we'll we'll be ready to go. I think it there should be a copy in there now. I'm happy to make a comment in the interim. Oh, good. <laughs> Thank you. We like that. Yes. I don't know if you have the um, assessment slide, uh, Marty. Let's see. So. Um, I have it here, but I just want to talk about that piece. Is this the is this is this the no? slide deck that we're? Yeah, there's the there's the hourglass I was talking yep. about that really provided the structure that we needed. When we started, we just weren't really sure how this was going to work, but. Um, by introducing that this year, I think it made a, a really significant impact in structuring the project. Yeah. And was the assessment uh, slide? The slide would be the last slide. There we go. Okay. Is that it? Yep. All right. So I just wanted to talk about assessment because I know this was an issue, and as a teacher, you're always a little bit you know, concerned about how are you going to assess that learning has happened, how are you going to 
hold students accountable. So I wanted to show you um, what the assessment, the final like assessment reflection piece looked like for this project. Um, number one, students created e-portfolios and using Google Sites. And so just like we have those six steps, they have six steps shown clearly with their both their individual work, um, grades that they've received, rubrics that have been filled out, having your pictures up there when it came to community members and targets. You're there, Dr. O'Shea's there, Mr. Landers is there. Um, but we made sure that we wanted a receptacle, a way for them to showcase what they did, and you know that's part of um, civics action is also showcasing. So we wanted to make sure that um, would be there. And I don't know if this link will, how the link will work for you, but you want uh, to click on it and yep. see. I did try to link one in so you would have an idea. Oh. Go back. That's okay. Um, it might not be. It should be shared with all of them in public schools, I thought, but maybe mm. not. That's a student yeah. project, so I can't bring. Can't, I can't. Okay. But, not a problem. Um, anyway, they're very structured. We provided a template. The teachers worked. We did our best to, in advance, try to envision what this was going to look like. Um, the first half um, of, the, of the portfolio, we had done a lot of summer work. We had a very good idea. But quite frankly, the second part, action, we'd never done it before. So we're trying to build a portfolio based on a project we've never fully implemented. So we have some work to do this summer to revise that. But um, overall, it, the actual second half of the portfolio is the more powerful half of the portfolio. Um, and then students also had to do a self-reflection on their learning. So for part one, um, I really wanted to focus on the vision of the graduate because every single one of these competencies was deeply embedded into the process and the product of this project. So I divided them into two groups, problem solving, critical thinking, communication was group A, group B was accountability, independence, and collaboration. I felt like group A were the meteor, um, sort of historic, like content-based. I really want two examples as you're writing of how you use those skills, and then just one from the second column. And so students um, wrote these, I, I've been grading them this week, these final reflections that are just amazing. Um, when they're giving examples, they had to back up what they're saying by real life examples of how they use these skills or strengthen these skills. For example, with communication, pretty much none of them had ever written a formal email to an adult that they don't know, <laughs> requesting something of them. So that was a lesson in itself and a process to get. So we started with, again, modeling, having them try it individually, getting in groups, critiquing, rewriting, and then eventually purpled up the one that was sent <laughs> so that Kevin didn't get 25 of them. Um, I appreciate that. <laughs> and um, so that was just one example. And then part two was really a self-reflection on accountability. Accountability is the social studies key competency, I mean we obviously teach all of them, but social studies in particular is accountability. So um, they had to describe, explain, and assess the specific actions that they took to meet the goal of the project. So it's really incredible how honest um, teenagers can be when they are being asked to do this type of reflection writing, okay? You, you might think that they would over inflate. Um, in fact, they tend to be quite critical of themselves. I think it's the nature of adolescent development. Um, but the fact that they're able to do this and give examples, right? This is what I did well. This is what I could have done better, right? And um, and they're, they're writing that in these reflection pieces. So, so I just wanted you to have a sense of how we are assessing the projects of the portfolios, part of the project grade and the um, reflection paper is another part of the um, action civics. And then there were all the grades along the way, um, all the individual components that they completed. Okay, so now I'm gonna introduce our ableism group because um, everyone else, is, like I'm here and they're here because of the work that my D block class has been doing on ableism. So come on up and feel free to introduce yourselves. Um, we had a separate presentation for this, I okay. Hold that up. Do you guys mind introducing yourselves while yeah, we get it pulled up? Um, 
My name is Aiden Rycheski, and I'm a student in her uh, D Block uh, 11th grade history. Uh, we, as uh, Ms. Sanders said, we've been working on this project all year, and we just wanted to showcase some of the things that we've done. Um, and I'm Maya Grohovska, and I'm also a student in Ms. Snyder's D Block uh, history class, and we're here to present our final product and proposal to you. So. For our Action Civics Project, we decided to do some things surrounding ableism and disability activism. I found out this project idea had been chosen, I was thrilled. My younger sister has Down syndrome, and myself and some of my friends and family members have various learning disabilities that have made our time in the district hard. I think that this project is important because it serves to highlight ways we can help and change the climate of our schools to be more inclusive of people whose abilities do not align with the norms of society. Uh, can we go back to the ableism one? Go back. Oh, okay, go forward. <laughs> yeah. Um, this one? No, no. It's, it's the next one. The next one. There we go. And the next one. And the next one. Yeah. Never mind. Yeah. Not in the Is it missing as well? Yeah. I think we have the same problem the uh, same kind of right. slides. Yeah. Yeah. Stand, stand by, let's see. The one online only had three pages in our online room. Mm -hmm. There are only three pages. Really? It's different than what, like I think looking at yeah. Nicole's, it's different than what I can see online. So I put the actual uh, PowerPoint or Google slideshow in the folder now. I've got ten slides here. Ten? Yep. There's ten. There's ten. That's more than three. Yes, <laughs> that's <laughs> 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 Yeah. <laughs> right. I'm going to go right to the original email, Ms. Snyder, and we'll see. Okay, it's in there. Now I see the one that you added that has 10. Yeah. yeah. The, the PDF file had three, and now yeah. this one is. There we right. go. Slide. Yeah, okay. it's there. All right. I think we're in business. All right. right, so stand by. Hang on a minute. All right. So you tell me where to. Please, no. Oh, oh, thank you. And bye, folks. Sorry it's about the delay. It's coming. It's coming. Okay. It's not sharing. 
Uh, give me one second. I have the slide that's missing on my computer, so um, Aiden's going to use that slide, and okay. if you just bring the other um, okay. presentation up, we'll work around All it right. that way. Hold, stand by. Hold on one second until we give you the go ahead, because I'm still trying to pull it up on the uh, on the big screen here. Behind for some reason. Uh, there we go. Yeah, yeah but it's still not. Yes, we're not. Right, we're not. There we go. Okay. Mm -hmm. can, can you pick, go back to that screen mirroring thing on your top? You know, did you get the desktop one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's the, yeah. Three fingers swipe sideways. Good. That's up. Just like that. That's how I get to the other desktop online. But I don't know. Sorry, folks. Is there a choice? Sorry. Well, we'll get the no, it's, 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 Go to that one again. It's sure. Can I ask a general question while they're looking for it? Sure. Um, I hope that's okay. But um, and maybe this is. Well, um, are there any plans, or have you all done a kind of like a? like an open room, I guess, like an open house or a, you know, where family and friends came yeah, in and were able to yeah, you know, look at posters or hear the reflections read by the students? Or? Um, not this year. This year was really just figuring out the second half of the project and implementing, you know, we created the portfolios, which certainly can be published. Um, you know, like we said, there's more work to be done. And also the climate at the high school the last two weeks have like it's just yeah we're just trying to finish the yeah. year this year so that would be something that y'all would be open to because i feel um, like i i i can't speak for the department so i don't okay. can't get back to his own yeah. desktop you go back in this room so who who is there a uh, chair screen. of the department like yes who? yes megan schwartz is the department oh, chair okay and she was on the whole attend Hedrick's um senior night for her right. daughter on sophomore <laughs> so just because it's such valuable you know go like back there i think no, I mean, ten of us okay. in this okay. room and ten of us um, watching. No, I want uh, not that. It's just valuable. It's not giving. It gave you the access two seconds ago. Is there something that's top or missing? All the way to the top. Also go the no. Nope. Okay. So close it out and go back in one more time. Done, display preferences. Causes that you're supporting. Just go to so. display preferences. I also had a question, um, you, Mr. Schneider. You said that. For this particular class, the speech and debate was very, it was quite lively. Could you elaborate on okay, that? Maybe there. some funny stories. Oh, yeah. I'm, a big, I'm okay. a big speech and debate guy. So. Actually, I, I'm going to turn that over to my uh, and cool. because they can tell you about it. So uh, we had the dog park side and we had the ableism side, and we've kind of gotten to groups and we talked about the dog park, why we think we should focus our project on that, and then we had uh, conversely on that side talking about ableism, and then. Together as a class, we got together and debated both sides. Uh, this was like a way earlier in the year, so I don't remember it that much. Oh, I remember um, it. <laughs> <laughs> there was a lot of yelling. Yes, it was good. Yeah, it was a really great debate. It really exactly. was high engagement. Yeah, it was. Um, what we initially did is um, Ms. Snyder went through our essays that we wrote for our individual topics, and she picked like the five. Mm, clearest ones got rid of repetition they were all each individual topics and she had us read through them that night and then vote on them on a Google form and like we tied on ableism and the dog park we and rank issue voted we did not just majority vote yeah. mm -hmm. that was another learning process so that was really interesting and fun 
All right, so I think we have our technical difficulties uh, solved here. So if you tell me which slide uh, you'd like us to be on, and I hope I have the right. Uh, We're that perhaps the slide somehow didn't make yeah. it into okay. what yeah. was sent. You okay. can start on the title yeah. slide. Yeah. It's fine. Okay. Um, you want to go back to the front? Yeah, sure. Yeah, let's go back to the Okay. Yeah. All right. What is ableism? Ableism is the systemic and interpersonal discrimination and prejudice against people with disabilities. It can be obvious, such as making fun of someone who has a visual impairment, but it also includes smaller actions that may seem harmless on the surface, such as playfully mimicking someone who pronounces something strange, not knowing they have a speech impediment, or ostracizing someone who is socially awkward, unaware that they're autistic. While neither of the latter would be considered kind, most people wouldn't immediately jump to the assumption that they're making fun of a disabled person. This is because disabled people can have both visible and indivisible disabilities. It's important when discussing disability justice that both categories of people are included. Okay, so much like Aiden, this proposal was exciting for me and it hit close to home. See, my family has a progressive and chronic genetic disability that slowly degrades our muscles. So all of my life, I have witnessed, heard stories about, and experienced ableism, whether it was small comments like being lazy or sitting out with my aunts and mapping out a walking route for our shopping trip because they had to make our shopping trip like Operation Overlord. <laughs> it's a problem plaguing the world and unfortunately Longmeadow Public Schools aren't immune. Fifty percent of LHS students uh, You can go to the next slide, the next slide, there we go. <laughs> 50% of LHS students witness or experience some form of ableism, and nothing is being said or done about it. This is revealing the cracks in our educational about disabilities or how to understand and interact with them appropriately. People turn to toxic behaviors, which creates social learning and physical obstacles worsening the challenges for those with different abilities and creating new barriers for them to add to the existing. The lack of positive communication about visible and invisible disabilities causes further impediments in our peers' education, and the effects of school bullying will ripple throughout their entire lives. With just over a week of the survey being active, can you go no, forward to? That one? Once again, forward again. There we go. With just over a week of the survey being active, we collected an abundance of testimonies depicting students' experiences of ableism across LHS. Here we listed some of the most striking. Um, anonymous surveyors from inappropriate language being used to the most pervasive form of ableism. There are testimonies from students who see people mocking their peers who might not have the social awareness to recognize that they are being marginalized. After all, this marginalization was a common practice for the majority of human history and only recently has been recognized as wrong. You can go back to the previous, back to the previous slide. Uh, no, back to, yeah, there we go. Now this might seem upsetting, but here's the good news. 82% of students believe that education about anti-ableism would help these attitudes. All forms of prejudice are formed from a perceived difference. With more relatability to those with disabilities, the hope would be that this form of ableism would end. And then you can go back to the, to the project slide. So front, in front, front, front. There we go, there we go. Our class wants to educate the LPS community, and we've come up with a couple, couple different ways to accomplish this. We have no intention of disrupting the students' cr critical thinking, critical learning, or distracting them from their academic paths. Instead, we wish to enhance their curiosity in the subject and guide them to acceptable forms of information. Our class, with the help of Ms. Kennedy and Ms. Snyder, has written a LEAF grant for books addressing disabilities in an attempt to normalize them. We've budgeted and researched books for all grade grades K through 12 levels and have been granted by permission by every school and their librarians to set up displays. We're so lucky to have artists and photographers in abundance in our class and they've created colorful posters for each of the displays. We hope that this will strike a passion in students to be more empathetic and understanding of those who have physical or mental struggles beyond the norm. 
you okay. can go over to keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. There, there you go. Okay. Oh, yeah. So the reason we're here, though, bugging you, is because <laughs> we want to do more. We want them to, we want the students to interact with disabilities, to celebrate them, and to recognize the similarities and differences between us all. That's why we're proposing a district-wide day of disability. This would be on December 3rd. It coincides with the National Day of Disability. This would allow classes to have developmentally appropriate discussions about the topic and learn about disabilities by watching short movies, hearing a book in class, or even just taking part in an interactive activity. This would be an incredible opportunity to teach everyone effective and appropriate ways to interact with people. It's not just awareness that this will impact, though. A disability-minded education increases children's em empathy. And as they grow into adults, they will be more empathetic human beings. Having or knowing someone different and celebrating that is a special thing. And we need to implement it in the LHS and LPS community. Thanks Thank for you. listening. <laughs> Thank you. Comments or questions? Nicole, then Gian. All right. Um, thank you so much to both of you for coming out and talking to us about your project also. Um, same things, I love hearing how the whole process went and I love that there was a heated debate um, in the <laughs> class about where to go and how to make this happen. Um, I, I think be building. Um, it sounds like you guys have put a lot of effort and energy into thinking about this in a way that is very centralized to your class and to your school, but also to looking out into the larger community. I like that you tied in to the National um, Day to celebrate disabilities. I love that you thought to look for community funding um, and to reach out to LEAF um, with a grant. Those are all things that really engaged you in a broader sense um, in the community, and I appreciate you guys taking the time to come here and tell us more about that. Um, I do have a question, but I'm going to wait because I think we have things maybe related a little bit more to the specific topic, and my question is more general. But um, thank you so much, and I, I definitely wish you guys um, good luck with moving forward. That's it's an excellent idea. I like I like the tone of celebration. That's a really great way to approach the topic. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you, Kevin. Uh, so. Again, amazing work, just your compassion, your empathy, y'all use that word a lot. Um, so thank you for that. I am, so, and I'm glad to hear that you're planning for, you know, additional steps, additional activities. And I work a lot with, you know, um, students with special needs in my own school and with the, the people in my building who, um, so Ms. Snyder, I'd, I'd love to offer to, um, help think about those other those other targets that y'all call them out there um, and help in any way that I can to connect um, in thinking towards you know if, if your day of diversity comes to fruition and, and the planning and, and the connecting for that um, I'm also wondering have y'all heard of the Special Education Alliance of Longmeadow it's called SEAL mm -mm. okay so that's a that would be my first you know um, it's SEAL M A so it's S E A L ma.org um, and that's a group right out of right out of long meadow uh, is jean on the is jean she's on, on the youtube i don't think she's on this call okay so jean from miss schneider have you heard of jean fontaine yes i know i know i'm, a, I'm familiar with, with both the organization as well okay so the, i think they would be a fantastic you know um you know sooner versus uh, and again i know we have 17 days of school left um so again just offering my support for any of that um, but particularly on the seal representative so i definitely think you should, should connect with seal and then superintendent i was wondering you know our policy subcommittee we, we're still our project is still to be looking at language and different policies that we want to kind of make sure we're hitting the this isn't a new issue but like newer with even with like the language like i'm wondering can we look when we, when we have our sub, 
subcommittee meeting soon at some point. Um, you know, can we look for language that's, because I, I hadn't ever heard the word ableism, and I definitely didn't know it meant discrimination, you know, like. Sure. Um, so can we look yeah, for I, language yeah. to ensure specific that we have, to ableism? Yeah, and see? Uh, up to date, inclusive language in, in, in the policy manual, and that, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. 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 I just, I just want to say, like, this was a huge topic for them to undertake, and they very, thoughtfully researched and I think in the beginning they struggled with how to go about <clears throat> taking an, a specific action and so I think because they are so reflective um, they wanted to do something that would be ongoing and so you know eventually we, we went in the direction that you did right because we they felt that by having the district recognize it and hopefully getting the LEAF grant, grant funded, um, that there would be new up-to-date books, K-12, and even resources for educators, because they included that in their book list. Mm -hmm. um, they were taught by the librarian the vetting process, so that was someone who they, they worked with, but that they wanted to make the posters, have them laminated, so that they were very mindful of not wanting to put a burden on the classroom teacher and that they wanted to do all the work on this project and sort of like right deliver everything and have it all there ready to go so they even looked at um, different posters like for different grade level like what's appropriate for a k2 poster versus a middle school poster versus a high school poster so um, there was a tremendous amount of work. We, they also, we looked at the town side of things too, and there's a lot to work to be done. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, like I said, the difficulty for this class was where, which do we go after? Like where can we make a, take a concrete action that's going to be long lasting? And I think that was the biggest part of like the struggle we went through. We had many, many discussions about this. So. Well, and you're, and thank you for saying that, Ms. Schneider, but so in talking about the policy, so y'all should know that your research and your planning for, you know, the posters and, and applying for the grant and bringing this to our attention, I'll speak for myself, has now prompted me to say to our superintendent, well, hey, when we're looking at policy, because the school system, I don't know how familiar with the school system has a whole bunch of policies, and one of them that we were, you know, starting to, to look at was, you know, hate speech or harassment. And there's, there's what, 500 policy superintendents? I'd say so, yeah. So what you have done is, again, I mean, it's amazing just by virtue that you've done it, the research and coming here. But now we're taking it to something that could possibly be long-lasting. Some of these policies have been around for years. Um, so that's just one thing um, in addition to you know, the great stuff that you've already done. So, but again, that's why it's important that y'all come here and you share with us what you're doing because now we've got you know, other steps that we can do as a committee. I guess I should speak for myself. But um, I know that I'll be bringing this again to superintendent's um, attention. So, uh, so that's just another valuable piece of, of what you're doing. So thank you for that. Thank you, Jana. Susie, go ahead. Thank you. I, I just want to, um, you know, you put the A in action civics. Um, I'm, I'm so impressed with um, what you've been able to accomplish and um, what you're doing in real time, in real ways, um, to make the community better. And I just couldn't be prouder. I want to just go back to one thing you said, and I think it's important, and I don't think it can be emphasized enough. Um, I, I, I appreciate the fact that um, you know you, you're promoting um, solutions that uh, don't take away critical academic time. However, I think it's important to recognize that if one person doesn't feel a sense of belonging in the school, then it's everyone's responsibility to make sure that we come together and, and create that sense of belonging for everyone. So what you're doing is um, incredibly, incredibly important um, and, and probably is the foundation of what a, a good school 
and a good community really is all about. It's inclusive of everyone. So I, I just want to thank you um, for everything you're doing and, and all of the great attention um, you're bringing to it in, in real uh, actionable ways. Thank you, Susie. Mary. I want to comment about both projects, the real world application of these skills in your futures. When you see a problem in the community, you're going to know how to research it. You're going to know how to write that email to the grown up that might be able to help you. You might even be a grown up. Some grown ups don't know how to write emails to other grown ups. <laughs> um, but you will be able to take action based on this experience. And that is what we want students to be able to do to go out into the world in your jobs and in your lives and be able to look at the world around you and to make it better. So the practical application of skills that you will have as a result of projects like these is to me the most exciting part of it. The topics that you picked are profound and I think will make a difference in our community, but I also think that the skills you're learning to be able to take actions on issues that you care about um, is something that will serve you well for your entire lives. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, Broderick, go ahead. Hello, thanks. I just wanted to um, thank Ms. Snyder and the students for taking the time to present to the school committee. Um, these are really, really impressive, and I look forward to um, the progress that they make. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks, Broadway. And <laughs> the thing that I want to say to you guys, uh, You've set the bar really high <laughs> for future students who come after you. Um, these are great models for what I'm sure you want to accomplish in the future. And I think that's important for you to know is that students coming after you will look at the work you've done and they'll be motivated by the work you've done to do really impressive work as well. So thank you for setting the bar high. Um, and, and you've given you know, your fellow classmates something to aim for and to do really great work. And, and I hope that we'll continue to have students present their projects so we can see what great work you're doing. So thank you so much. Kevin, just to uh, comment on that, um, you know, a couple years ago, the uh, upper elementary went on the, the plastic bags mm -hmm. or bad, um, single-use plastic bags are bad. For the town, we start this project by showing them that video, and those students are now ninth graders at high school. They'll be rising sophomores. Oh and, and I have to say, in my teacher mind, I was like, when I first started this three years ago, I was like, yeah, like how are we ever going to do something like that? Um, but I think it just speaks to the power of these types of projects and what these students are able to do when they're given an opportunity to pursue something that they're passionate about. And so I no longer feel like intimidated um, by the plastic bag monster. Um, I think my juniors this year hit it out of the park and I'm so proud of them. So thank you so much. Absolutely. Well, and, and, and also, I mean, you, you haven't asked to so the school committee. You want us to do yeah. something. Um, and so I, I don't know if we need a formal motion to do this. I know I was going to ask the superintendent to, to make that happen. Um, I don't know if we want to have a formal vote or what we want to do, but I think that's something that we can easily say to, to Marty, um, yeah, this is a great idea. Can you look into this and, and figure out how to make it yeah. happen? Yeah, I would be eager to support. Um, I'm. I'm so happy to hear Ms. Snyder mention the plastic bag project. <laughs> that was, it was a video that we showed at convocation a convocation about That's, two or three years ago, and, yeah. and, and it's sort of what when we when we present projects like this or when we presented that project at convocation, we're we're holding up uh, moments of learning like this to illustrate you know how we can really stretch our students and challenge our students, and and it was so the, the rigor of this was really clear and loud to me. So. In answer to your question, I, yeah, absolutely stand ready and eager to, to support and, and help out and, and make this a, a district-wide uh, celebration. So. And these guys will be seniors next year, right? So they'll know yeah. if this is happening. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, yeah, they're coming back if it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, Susie, we have a question. Go ahead. I don't have a question. I'd love to make a motion to uh, designate December 3rd. And I can't, re I can't remember the actual anti-ableism day is that what it is or is it Celebrate. the no. district day of disability was district day of disability i would like to make a motion that the school committee um 
designate December 3rd as the district, the Long Meadow Public Schools District Day of, uh, of Disability. Do we have a second? Second. Do we have discussion? Cool. I do. Um, I'm wondering if we might want to attach it to a day as opposed to a date, because this year, December 3rd, will be a Saturday. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious if we might want to do something like the first Friday in December mm -hmm. or something else that gives us a guaranteed everybody is in school kind of day. How yeah. would you guys feel about that? Yeah, that'd yeah. be perfect. Do you have a preference for can, any particular can, time? Can we, can I just... Yeah. friendly I, don't, I can't make a motion but sure. I can we let the superintendent figure out the details yeah, absolutely is that yeah better? absolutely Susie sure. are you are you good with that absolutely okay so can, Susie do you mind amending your motion to some and oh and uh, so I would add to and allow the superintendent uh, to implement as on a date um, on an appropriate date and our seconder? Second. Okay. Again. Perfect. <laughs> uh, further discussion? Susie, is that a, a hand to talk more or? Oh, sorry. I keep no, forgetting fine. to lower my hand. Okay. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Any other discussion? Okay. I think we will vote. All right. Nicole? Yes. Mary? Yes. Gianna? Yes. Jamie? Yes. Bronwyn? Yes. Susie? <clears throat> yes. And yes for me? All right, there we go. Yay. It's happening. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, Nicole. Thanks. I'm wondering if I can ask. Oh, we have one more. Nicole, oh, okay. one more question. Yeah. You guys are good. But um, more general request and question. Um, sure. Request. I'm wondering if there's any way. We option available because I know we would all love to get to see that Absolutely. exemplar and how it came out yeah. that would be wonderful Absolutely. to yeah. check out awesome and then I'm curious if you can speak to how is this working across all of the junior level classes is there different implementation um, if somebody's doing AP level classes does it happen at different grades how is this set up Mr. Landers I'm gonna delegate that to you happening in all US history classes AP is a little different. They have to do a, a condensed version post exam. Okay. But all the other, I want to give credit to Mrs. Uh, Snyder. I also want to give credit to Mrs. Pollard, Mr. Sweeney, and Mrs. Ingraham. Um, I think the main difference was that, and I like the model that Mrs. Pollard and Mrs. Snyder followed, was to force students to come to some uh, consensus either on one project or two. Mr. Sweeney kind of took the approach of there are pros and cons to both but one of the philosophies of this project from DESE when they created the new frameworks was let's make students collaborate together and let's lead them and, and have them work towards consensus. So happening in all U.S. history classes AP is definitely different and it's a condensed version post exam. Gotcha. Thank you for coming out and thank you to all of the other teachers who are participating in and making this happen as well. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much. Thank you. Have a great night. Great. All right. Um, now to handbooks. Right. Mm -hmm. So perhaps not as uh, entertaining and <laughs> no. intriguing, but also reflective of a considerable amount of work in consensus building. So uh, tonight, Longwood High School Principal Tom Landers and Assistant Principal Paul Dunkerley are here to present proposed changes to the Longwood High School Handbook. And they worked uh, in action civics ways to build consensus and bring you the changes that are before you tonight. Uh, there was a uh, some material in your uh, meeting packet overviewing the changes and a brief description of the rationale for each of those changes. So uh, thank you for joining us, gentlemen. Thanks for having us, uh, everyone here. Thank you, everybody at home. Um, so I'm going to hand this to Mr. Dr. Lee because he has done, uh, kind of done the lion's share of the, of the um, organizing and facilitating of the people who, who brought this. But I want to recognize two 
entities in this process. One, um, <coughs> the school council. School council has a has a statutory responsibility in uh, any proposed handbook changes. And at LHS, it comes from the LHS Handbook Committee, which Mr. Dunkerley has chaired, and he'll talk a little bit about, but it came to um, our school council, and, and we spent, um, I think we had seven meetings, and we spent three, three and a half discussing this. We started in our first meeting in October, mm -hmm. just because I had made a promise to you guys about a year ago here that I would do that. We brought you some changes last year, and I think we improved it, but I think it was recognized that we could continue to improve it. So. We're currently at 17 items. We're proposing seven, streamlined, simple. So I want to thank my school council. I also want to thank Mr. Dunkerley because Mr. Dunkerley is retiring this year, but he is finishing his 18th year as chairperson of the LHS handbook. 17 years as the main co uh, as the main chairperson. I think you were co-chairperson. Were you co-chairperson with uh, Mr. Marty O'Shea way back when? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, He's still fixing things that I... Uh, <laughs> and he just does an amazing job. Uh, very inclusive, very methodical, very transparent, very fair. Pulling students in, pulling staff in. So um, we bring you a, what we think is uh, an improved and streamlined um, and um, pr some proposals that... Hopefully uh, you have you have read, and hopefully uh, we can answer, and hopefully you agree with. So, with that said, I want to introduce Mr. Paul Dunkerley, who served as the chairperson of this committee um, this year as well. Okay, thank you, Tom. So, first of all, I just want to say I'm not sure how I'm going to follow the action <laughs> civics thing. <laughs> yeah. So, please, I hope the standard wasn't set too high for us <laughs> on this. Uh, and having said that, I just wanted to just take Kyrie a couple of minutes to give everybody some background on how we go about approaching uh, a look at the student handbook, which occurs annually, and how we wind up from the beginning of that process to making a proposal here for those changes um, to the school committee. So it starts off uh, right around mid-year, and I basically put an invite out to every single student and every single faculty and staff member and say, if you would like to be a part of this committee, please let me know, and your membership basically is guaranteed. I give them a little bit of a qualifier because we do meet multiple times. We meet weekly, uh, basically, until we're done. And what we found is we need to start in January so that we can be done hopefully by around April 1st because we do need to give enough time to go to school council and allow them to uh, do their review and give them their opportunity for their due diligence. So that's how we start and then we work till we're done. Um, this year on our committee we had uh, students Rhea Sandler, Katie Goodhines, Maddie Busolari, and Hamna Mustafa. And staff members, we had uh, world language teacher Melissa Candon and my partner in the VP world, uh, Mrs. Lisa Estradios, and then myself as chair. So we started off by bringing the group together, and the very first thing we did is we put something out to every faculty and staff member and every student and said, what do you want the committee to look at? Everything in this book is fair game. And so they brought the things that they they were aware of as individuals, and we actually made a couple of attempts to get information from the student body, faculty, and staff. And we got a fair amount of, of responses this year, and that's what we built our work on. Uh, it is, a, after all, a student handbook, and needs to reflect, you know, in our school, what the students perceive their needs are. Um, to kind of go backwards, when, when I start, first started doing this, and. Um, just like I like to tell people that it's Marty's fault that I'm here as a, an employee of the Longmeadow Public Schools because he hired me. It's Marty's fault that I'm here as an administrator because he said, hey, Paul, what do you think about Once Upon a Time? Hmm. Remember that story, Marty? Yeah. Do. yeah. And uh, he was the one who invited me the, my very first year uh, as an employee to say, hey, do you want to be on this committee? <laughs> Only to make me co-chair the next year and then he was off to... Uh, uh, to the next step in his career, and he left me holding the bag, and I've not been able to get rid of it ever since. That's the rule. If you need something done, you ask a busy person. So that was that's why I approached okay. you. <laughs> sure, we'll, we'll go with that. So anyway, that's the process. And we work together as, as a group. Sometimes we have a little bit of homework uh, where people will go and research things that other districts are doing when we're looking at, you know, whatever it is. 
Uh, we'll go look at other handbooks. We'll, we'll talk to folks and things like that. And so it's really the effort of a lot of people to bring this together. I'm not going to tell you that we are uh, ba basically as loud or argumentative, perhaps, as the Action Civics kids were, but we did have some pretty spirited conversations and debates around a few of these items. And this is what our consensus, what we came up with by consensus, this was voted on by everything that's here in front of you was voted by and by the committee, and it was unanimously voted on to bring forward. And at which point we brought it to school council, and now we are here. So. I know you've had an opportunity to look at the contents of the package, and I think maybe it just makes sense um, if, if you have any questions or comments, so please let me know, and I'll see how well I can address those. I think maybe we can just go through by section and see if people have comments or questions sure. by section, if that is okay. Absolutely. All right, so the first one relates to the LHS dress code, and I know this has come up before at the school committee, so I think we're appreciative that there is a revision of the dress code. So uh, I'm curious if people have comments or questions. We have the language from the current handbook and then the proposed language. Um, would anybody like to have, does anybody have a comment or a question on the proposed code of dress and grooming? Um, I'm just very appreciative that um, it is gender neutral and that it focuses on covering body parts, not on specifically the types of clothes that can and can't be worn. And also um, that it really reflects a commitment to a comfortable, non disruptive learning environment. Um, I did have some questions about hoods. I was just curious about the difference sure. between hats and hoods and why one is allowed and one isn't or allowed in some circumstances. And I was just putting my um, kid hat, pun intended, on <laughs> <laughs> or hood to mm -hmm. say, why can I do one and not the other? And I was just curious about how you would talk to kids about that. Sure, sure. So for us, the, the fundamental <laughs> difference between a hat and a hood is you can still recognize a student who's wearing a hat. When they put a hood up, okay, you're really only, all that's left is the front of their face. If a student's wearing a hat, I can still see the back of their head, I can see the high side of their head, and I can identify them pretty easily. But once a hood is up, it becomes for us a safety concern. You know, is that an LHS student that we see in the hallways? If that particular individual is acting in a way that's not appropriate, how can we easily identify them or intervene? It's so much easier to intervene when a student may not be doing what you want them to if you can call them by name rather than saying, hey, you, you know, or something like that. But it's the safety, the safety concern that's first and foremost for us. Um, the other side of that is, you know, why do we allow them to wear hats? I think that's maybe part of your question, Mary. Um, and, I just, yeah. And, and, and I just want to say the wearing of hats has become very much accepted in our society. You can go to a very expensive restaurant, and it's not uncommon to see somebody wearing a hat. You can go to any family-style restaurant and see a lot more folks wearing hats. People wear hats everywhere. So we didn't feel like we were really in a position to kind of buck that trend, if you will, but rather to, to embrace it and make sure that where it's appropriate, like for example, if we were having a lab and there was something that might be flammable or something like that, teachers absolutely going to instruct the students to take their hats off. Okay, and that's, you know, that's not something that is debatable. It's a safety issue, so we're going to ask them to take the hat off. Just the same as we don't want kids to wear jewelry while they are in, uh, in ath ath athletics, right? You know, if an earring gets caught or a necklace gets caught, you know, we're asking for somebody to get injured there. So it's, it's along those lines. It's a safety issue um, in both, both cars. Does that make sense to you? It does. I think okay. I was actually more on the line of why can't they also wear hoods? But I get what you're saying. Yep. Um, I was thinking, because I'm just, again, thinking about talking to a teenager. Well, Mom, some people would wear a hat and a mask. And would that be okay? And so I just, those are conversations I think that might come up with kids um, because masks, you know, are not specifically mentioned in the policy but are very common now. So, right. Just, that's really all. We, yeah. I, I just yeah. was putting it out there that I think this could potentially come up. But overall, I think the revisions are definitely a, um, a positive. <laughs> Thank you. I've got, we've got to give the students a lot of credit for this. Um, they spent, we spent the majority of our time in the committee work on this, and there was a lot of conversations by, by our students, and they came away feeling really good about this. 
They thought it was fair. These are their words, fair, equitable, and enforceable. And as an administrator, I look at this and I say, I now have a tool that I think I can use, and I can also work with students with, it doesn't feel punitive, it doesn't feel uh, aggressive, it feels appropriate and responsible. Go ahead, Nicole. Please. Okay. Um, I, to echo what Mary said about the uh, more inclusive nature, and I also appreciate um, more gender lang uh, gender neutral language um, being included here. Um, would I be correct then in assuming that the hoods would be more of a hallway issue than a once you're settled into a classroom kind of issue, or are they continue to not be allowed? Obviously, again, assuming teacher requests for reasons that might be safety related and or otherwise behaviorally related. Um, I'm curious if it's a not at all or if it's a not while traveling in the hallways. So where we where we see it mostly is kids traveling in the hallways or for example at lunch. Yeah. Um, when I walk by classrooms I don't really see it yeah. but we do see it in those places and I think that's one of those things that you do ha kind of have to be universal about. Yeah. So yeah. Thank you for clarifying. Yep. Yeah. Other comments or questions on the dress code? Jeff? Thanks, Kevin. Yeah, thank you, everybody, and, and you both here and everybody else that, that helped, and especially the students. Um, I, my question is about number seven. Mm -hmm. um, and, and just because we were just talking about policies, and my mind is now on like hate speech, and so number seven for me. Um, like I were to work at a school. I'm not allowed to wear anything political. Um, I'm not allowed to wear anything that is, you know, like if it's defined as an organization that is, you know, could be like a hateful organization or an organization that promotes some kind of violence or discrimination against others. Um, I almost wish there was a it, and maybe maybe it's you know maybe it maybe where it says something that becomes disruptive to the educational uh, process may not be worn at school, but I that to me still seems a little bit like. Could I take a <laughs> shot at that? Yeah, I'm so not the the this the, the um, rules pertaining to students are different than the rules pertaining to staff. So staff in their in their public position have actually more limitations than than uh, students do in terms of what they can wear and so we have to protect political speech and students have a, a right to that and so that, that that number seven was one that I reviewed with our council and she was pleased with the language there and then pleased with the bullet that was below it as well so uh, it's it's what we can wear in as in our in our public position versus what students can wear so students have a right to um, their their speeches. Political speech is protected for students generally. Mm -hmm. Okay, but does that also? And thank you for saying that. Yeah. And, and and I know that, but I guess in a way, I feel like as an educator and as a model and as somebody who is working with students all the time. So I, I do understand kind yeah. of the professionalism part of it, and that I'm a you know an employee of an organization. Right. I just it really comes down to intent. If a, if a student were to intentionally wear something to be intentionally disruptive, then then you know the administration would be in a position to address it. But maybe, that's so a hard standard to prove, frankly. But yeah, yeah. I, I just I, I'm just thinking because there's there's so many there's so many slogans out, and I'm not just I'm not talking. I'm not talking Republican, I'm not talking Democrat, I'm not talking, I, I'm talking just from a humanity sense. There's so many things that are so hateful and negative and I would say disruptive. Um, just again, yeah. we heard Susie say, if one student feels uncomfortable or unsafe with something, yeah. um, you know, I, I'm struggling with this because I get the free speech, yeah. I get the, you know, we can't be tackling. Certainly, um, hate, yeah, hate speech is not protected in, in under any circumstances. So, if there's anything that is disruptive or discriminatory or 
or or targeting an, an individual based on their identity, then that would not be that would not be tolerated. That would be addressed by the administration. And so an organ so if, if a shirt is maybe affiliated with an organization or a group that has been labeled or what's the formalized or formally thought of as a hate group or a group that promotes violence or discrimination against others. Um, mm -hmm. I guess you'd take it like case by case if somebody comes to school. Correct. And we have to take it case by case. Okay. So yeah. that that <clears throat> sentence number seven then. Yeah, that's straight out of Supreme Court law, actually. Okay. okay. So somebody comes in, somebody's like, hey, that's making me feel uncomfortable. They come to you and say, can you think about this or? Yeah, we'd want students to be comfortable to come to us. I, <clears throat> um, it's, a, it's a balance between free speech and you, but you don't want disruption and you want to create a respectful environment. We have, we have respectful students. We, we invite robust dialogue. That's democracy. That's First Amendment. <clears throat> but when it becomes disruptive, we, we, we would have the right to act on it. Okay, thank you. John, I think Dagan wanted to comment. Oh, thank you. Oh, I could just respond to the disruptive part of it. And I, I do think, as like, kind of answer my question because you are taking it case by case. I just think the the language of disruptive can be very. It it would have to be taken case by case. For instance, I mean, a lot of people use this in my generation of the students in in LHS in question. Use the term trigger warning a lot, being triggered by something or the, or an aggression or a microaggression. For instance, you have a student who wear, you know, we live in Massachusetts, you have a student wear a Trump shirt. Someone could, you know, get upset by that and offended. However, that, that shirt would be protected under that under that student's, you know, right to their expression, their free speech. So I was just, I was kind of cleared up for me. My comment was kind of prior to the case-by-case -case scenario because the, the term disruptive rather than actual hate speech are two different things. Rather because the, the student could not be hateful, but that, like Mr. Landers says, it would cause a robust discussion due to a student wearing XYZ, whether that's BLM, Blue Lives Matter, Trump, Biden, whatever. That's all I had to say. I, I trigger people with my Yankee hat, but. Yeah. <laughs> <Sure. Anyway. laughs> oh, Susie, go ahead. Yeah, I think it's important to note that the, the term, and it could also, it could almost be in quotes because disruptive is not the term, it's disruptive to the educational process. That is a legal term that every state must use in determining whether or not, it's, it's sort of a catch-all phrase for any type of behavior or any type of situation or any type of something that can be categorized as um, you know, if the, if the normal operations of school cannot take place because of what is actually occurring, then that's a disruption to the educational process. If a, if a student cannot access their education in the, in the regular way, that's what this uh, kind of entails. And it could be multiple students, but as, um, the, um, as Tom and Paul have mentioned, it's really about um, it's, it's, that's the catch-all for everything that Gianna was describing that could be under there, that could be offensive and really um, disrupt a, a student's uh, normal school day. So that is a legal term that is sort of a, a, an opportunity to take those case-by-case -case issues and, and lump them into one, one uh, area. Having dealt with that for the the majority of my tenure in public schools. <laughs> thank you, Susie. Very helpful. Gianna, go ahead. And thank you, Susie and, and, and Dagan. Thank you for you said it much better than than I was trying to get it out. But um, and Tommy mentioned the balance because it, it. I guess for me, it's not so much like. For me, it does come down to like protecting somebody from feeling safe and use the word triggered versus, yeah, like I get the, the free speech, I get that, you know, we're trying to, I'm a school counselor, I get kids to try and tell their opinions and feelings all the time. So, um, so I, 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 I appreciate the clarification on that there would be a chance for, 
for some kind of conversation. I just didn't know if perhaps there was like a list of things that cannot, like a specific list of like, you can't walk around with, you know, like a specific list of like organizations or things that couldn't be on a sure. I, I, you know, I guess that's what I was trying to figure I out. I think our lawyer would say don't have a list, <laughs> yeah. to be yeah. honest with you. Yeah. And, and that's fine. I just, I just wanted to know if maybe there was sure. something that could then make this a little more specific. Sure. But um, so Dagan, thank you again. Susie, thank you. Um, and yeah, thank you guys for the, the clarification. I think the case by case matter of that is really very important just because how I put this. Just because someone is offended by something does not mean it's hate speech. Mm -hmm. And does not mean a student should be penalized for wearing a certain piece of clothing, depicting a certain political opinion, just because it made, you know, the world, the, to a certain extent, you can, you can be uncomfortable, obviously not verging on making someone feel unsafe, but the world is uncomfortable. And I feel like that's what's gonna have to be measured in your conversations with, with these students. Anything else on the dress code? Okay. Next up, gymnasium. We added a sentence about jewelry. Comments or questions about jewelry? Gianna. Sorry, guys. Um, the sentence about no jewelry may be worn during health and wellness classes for safety reasons. Um, so, mother of a teenage girl, been a coach to teenage girls before. Can there be something, um, teacher discretion or adult discretion, um, you know when girls get their ears pierced? Or when anybody gets their ears pierced, sorry, I shouldn't say just girls, but when people get their ears pierced, for the first six weeks you can't remove them, and so kids put tape on them? Right. Short answer is there's discretion every day in, in, by teachers. Okay. Um, they don't make kids take rings off, for example. But if there was a ring that kind of was had something extended from it, but it's it's but if a teacher sees something like jewelry or the, you know loop earrings, necklace, chain, um, that could be caught. So um, and if they're sitting in a regular classroom in a health classroom, this doesn't apply. It says health and wellness because they're so melded these days. Yeah. But um, a teacher would treat it differently if they were in a a wellness movement class versus a health class. So uh, lo lots of lots of discretion. All right, so is, there a way, sense. is there a way to just possibly put in with teacher discretion? Because right now to me this looks like no jewelry may be worn at all. And if you're talking about I universality you're looking, and if you're talking about Yeah. I I would say in, in other parts of the book it kind of reiterates um, in, in, in certain parts that, that like administrators you know and have have the right to interpret and this and that we, we chose this language because and this has kind of been in there for years and it's never been an issue but it's 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 kind of a, a safety issue and that's that's you know it kind of made it through you guys have the right to change it if you guys would like to change it at, at your level, but this kind of, you know, past the dialogue, I think there's a little bit of trust there, professional trust that teachers have some interpretation. But you're right, it, it does read as, um, as it reads. I mean, I've got a rule follower for a daughter. She's going to look at this, she's going to think, I can't wear my stuff. Like, yeah. so I don't know how this works. I don't you can just add the word unsafe, no unsafe jewelry may be worn. Or, I don't, I guess I'm, I don't understand why we can't just put with teacher discretion, like Or, yeah, or either way, yeah, you could, you could put with, you know, at, with teacher discretion or unsafe, however, however you would like to amend it for clarity, I think is, that makes sense. Do you have a suggestion? Um, just to comment that leaving it up to the teachers is not, um, doesn't keep the teachers necessarily safe because then uh, people can interpret it different ways. Like this teacher allows that, this teacher doesn't. It's just not allowed. <laughs> and then if a teacher says, oh, you got your ears pierced, you can put tape over them, then I, I just feel like I would rather be more clear than just say, here's a rule, but a teacher could say otherwise. And the reality is 
human beings have to be human beings so that happens, but that's why we chose not to codify it. Um, very similar to MIA sports. You can't wear you can't wear it there. That, that is a that is a uh, an accommodation that referees make though. They let you tape your ears, right. for example. Right. So um, I would hope and think, and I there is common sense. If a, if a person said, "Oh my gosh, I got my ears pierced. I can't take this out," um, we would work. I, I'm confident that that would be resolved at the school at the student teacher level, and if not, if it came to us, it would be resolved in a common sense way. So, okay, but, and I'm trying. I'm not trying to be difficult, but now you're saying like, <laughs> like it either says it and it means it or it doesn't. So, but if again, if I'm hearing you and you're saying if a kid has earrings that can't be taken out and they go to the PE teacher, because we're only talking about PE teachers, it's not every teacher, yes. right? Yep. So. And can then, I just follow up, Janet? So, this is what the MIA rule is, right? This is this this, this matches is. what the what right. the sports rule so, is. I mean, I think that's where I'm at. If that is the rule to play sports at the high school level, why would we have it different? And I think it's clear that umpires and referees have discretion, just like teachers have discretion. I think it would be strange if we had something that was different than what the MIA rule was. For kids to participate in gym versus them playing sports. Yeah, I get that, but we just said that the MIA does allow for. But they don't put in writing. Them. Go ask the umpire, right? I mean, again, I want right. to make sure I'm saying. You're right. You're correct. Is it in writing that people have discretion? It's not. Because the it's MIA not says you can't wear jewelry. But again, we all know that the example you just gave, the umpires are not going to rip the earrings out of your ears. Okay. I mean, <laughs> right. I mean, this in, in, has this been an issue it's, for our it, sports teams? It, it's not an issue, and it's not yeah. an issue in in our our wellness classes either. It's, I will say, I think we should. I, I, I do think it should probably say wellness teachers instead of health and wellness because health takes place in a classroom, and it's not applicable here. To be fair, as I read this, mm -hmm. but you're absolutely right in terms of <coughs> wellness matches the MIA standard. Yes. And it's worth noting that's sentence correct me if I'm wrong Tom that sentence was previously in the in the it was number 11 on the original uh, dress code correct correct but you, mm -hmm. I mean you could add no unsafe jewelry if mm -hmm. you know it just to, uh, that's the intent right is, mm -hmm. is to make sure that kids aren't uh, wearing jewelry that's unsafe you know so uh, however or you know it's at the committee's discretion if you feel like that needs a little more clarity I think I'd, I'd be friendly to the idea of adding unsafe or some other qualifying phrase, something about teacher discretion, or however you want to, however you want to amend that, or Tom or Paul, if you have any thoughts on how to. Is there anything you, you would to help us get past this? That would strike there, health. Yeah, strike that's health. what I would suggest. Striking health. Yeah, yep. mm -hmm. I agree. Strike health. Mm -hmm. Is that? Yeah, and just. Just say no jewelry may be worn, worn, excuse me, during wellness classes for safety reasons, period. That's it. Susie. Yeah, I, I just, I think it's important when we think of student handbooks similar to policies that we just consider that um, these are, yes, they're, they're very important. They set up guidelines that, that, in, that basically guide how each of the administrators implements those policies, right? But you could probably say the same thing about all of the elements that are included here, meaning that there's discretion that you have to use in a case-by-case -case basis, even when you're issuing a detention, even when you're issuing a suspension. That it's that while these are here in black and white and intended to be, um, you know, be put forward as this is the rule, we all know that um, when these are actually implemented, all cases are a case by case basis. Um, that's how I would interpret a handbook. That's how I interpret policy, same way, um, district policy. So I think just for the purposes of like, um, not getting too much 
into the weeds of, I, I understand your point, Gianna. I just worry that um, you could say that about every single piece included here, that there's some sort of discretion, um, which would then render the entire document somewhat like unnecessary if you say that everything has discretion. Um, so I, that's, that's all I, I would like to kind of like put that that's my two cents around like what a handbook is intended for it's intended for yes these are the rules of the school these are the this is the operational um parameters that we use to sort of dictate how how we run school um and how we deal with certain issues but um i i i just think if we put at teacher discretion or at, at, at administrator discretion everything that it kind of just dilutes what the rules are to begin with Thank you, Susie. I think we're moving on. Okay. All right. Next up, um, detention office issued, and this is about rescheduling detentions and, yeah, scheduling detentions. Comments or questions on that part? And again, this is the page 41, detention office issued not seeing any comments or questions. Bronwyn. <coughs> I have a quick question. I, um, it says that uh, the students can't use the restroom during detention. Is that maybe at teacher discretion as well? Absolutely. There's, yeah. Uh, Brown, uh, I'm not sure Brownwood heard your answer, yeah. Paul. Uh, Brownwood, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Yep. yep. Other comments or questions on this one? Yeah, uh, can I just, so, yeah. Paul, so at the beginning, and I'm sure it does, um, and I see here the final thoughts, at the beginning of the handbook, mm -hmm. does it say something? Because now we've got Brownwood asking you about teacher discretion. I got set and Susie talked about so does it say somewhere that like it is kind of there are some moments for teacher discretion like we've got case by case with the with the with the clothing we've got teacher discretion with the earrings we got teacher discretion with the bathroom does it say it in the beginning like that there's there will be there's moments a, where there's a, there's sorry there's some statements about administrators having uh, takes context, intent, et cetera, into account. Okay. And that's a kind of a, a purposely broad statement For that we include somewhere near the, in the beginning of the book. Perfect. And, and so that, that covers that, everything. Yeah, right. we were encouraged okay. to do that years ago and it made right. a lot of sense. And, th and sorry, I'm not trying no, to that's okay. like, I, that's you know, okay. like, I'm also a literal reader, yep. so like no jewelry, you know. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, moving on. All right, next up, in-school suspension and or detention, uh, page 50. Questions or comments? Okay, moving on. Page 49. Cell phone camera to electronic devices. Okay. Page 51. Forgery or making a false statement. All right, continuing on, page 52 and 53. Parking pass. Okay. Uh, leaving the school building without prior permission. Page 53, using wearing an electronic device in a non-designated area. I'm not seeing any comments or questions on that one. Overdue Media Center Books. This is not needed. Excellent justification. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, taking a picture or video without the explicit permission of a staff member. Comment or 
question. Right. A lot of education on that piece. Mary, yeah. A lot general. of education. Yeah, question. Mary has a general question. Go for it. Um, I think because this is a handbook and it very much reads, um, you know, here is all of the things students cannot do during detention, or, you know, this is what happens. They can get suspended, they can get intro. It just reads very much like. And I actually called Marty this afternoon because I was like, I don't want to just blow the meeting up by bringing this up. But I also just think about um, our commitment to equity and thinking about um, restorative practices. And is a kid really learning much from going to detention and not doing all the things on the list and working on school about what they've done wrong and how to make it better? And I think that a lot more of that happens than how it's presented um, just in these revisions and in the handbook, and I know that that happens, and I guess it's just a more general comment that these are some things that I'm thinking about. You know, I'm thinking about how many kids are suspended, how do we use our in-school suspension, um, what supports are we giving to students who are consistently late, are we trying to find out the root causes of why behaviors are happening, and I know that's happening. I just think that um, when you read something like, this is what the policy said, or I know it's not policy, but this is what the guidelines said, and this is the new guidelines, it's just very cold, you know, and I don't think that that is the intention. I think that we probably do a lot more of that, um, of, of that work with students to help them arrive at why they might have made a mistake and how they can fix that mistake and do better next time. And another thing when we're thinking about equity is that we have these practices, so we need to look at them through an equity lens, but then also how are these um, punishments administered? Is it equitable? Are they enforced equitably across um, the school? So this is not the time to talk about that now. I just want it noted for the record yeah. that this brought up a lot of questions for me about our discipline practices. Yeah, suspensions, at great points. Suspensions are very, very low. Um, state of Massachusetts wants that, and to be fair, our student body gets credit for that, and yep. our administrators, and we work with students. Um, if you do have to, you try to err on the side of an internal suspension, because the student is better with you. Um, and and there's room to grow there, but we do more, increasingly we do more, especially when there is a victim. When there is a victim, we absolutely involve some restorative aspect. Um, we have our social workers, our school resource officer, and then individual teachers who have unique life experiences who have been very helpful in say, sitting and saying, this is how this happened to me and this is how it made me feel when it's appropriate and when if there's a victim you know if it involves a victim and it's appropriate and the victim wants to we sometimes facilitate dialogue and, and things like that but I agree um, we, we I know we're focusing on this the handbook is filled with lots of information this is the discipline part of it it's it's actually the minority part of the book but I, well taken, and, and it's, it's work that we do every day, and you try to, it's about improving student decisions. It's about redirecting behavior and, and trying to help kids, you know, get through. Um, we're nice. <laughs> we, we have to be firm at times, but we, but we, we have great kids, and um, luckily that is not a huge part of our daily, our daily work. But it's important to get it right, so when you do have to do that, it's not arbitrary, and you can say to a student and a family, this is why we're doing it, not because I, I want to do it, but point, point's taken. I'd, I'd just like to add something to that, that even when I'm talking to a student and we're talking about a detention, clearly you know, the infraction that goes with that was not substantial. But whether it's me or Mr. Landers or Mrs. Estradios, it's not a, oh, Come on in my office, you did this, here's your one detention, see you later. Those aren't the conversations that we have. We have conversations with kids around behavior and why that occurred. You know, and it, it sometimes, you know, depending on the relationship I have with the kid, I might look at them and go, really? And they go, yeah. <laughs> you know, I say, haven't we talked about this? Or aren't you, you're better than this, right? And the kid will go, I am, and then, okay. okay. And I and, think, yeah. Sorry. And so what, the, what I, where I was going with is, is with this all is it's about the relationship that we build with our kids. 
whether it's at a classroom teacher or an aide, a custodian, somebody who works in the lunchroom or an administrator. It's about the, the relationships that we build with kids on an individual basis and also a group basis. You know, the beauty of part, part of my job and Lisa's and Tom's is we don't know every kid. This is the beauty and the detriment. We don't know every kid individually, not like when you have a classroom, you know, five classrooms and you've got maybe 120 kids. You know every one of those kids. I have 900 kids. It's not possible for me to know all of them, but hopefully they know all, all of them know me. And they know me either by, because I've addressed them as a group or by extension because, you know what, Mr. Darkley gave me a consequence but he treated me well, he was fair, he, he, he was honest and all of that. And whether I could say that about myself or Tom or Lisa, it's about the relationships that we build. And I think that goes a long way to addressing all of our concerns about making sure that we do things in an equitable and fair way and that there is a social justice aspect of it. It's, it's about identifying the behavior and then doing something to change that behavior going forward so that the child learns from the experience in a positive way and doesn't repeat it not because they're afraid that Dr. Lee's going to come down on them but doesn't repeat it because they now recognize that there's a better decision that could have been made and they make those decisions going forward so for me that's what it's always been about it's the relationships that we build with our kids uh, and I think when we have good positive relationships I think that's one of the great reasons why we don't have a lot of suspensions we don't have and that's internal and external we don't have a lot of detentions I have many more conversations with kids around behavior than I do conversations about, and you're also getting a consequence. Our kids are awesome, and they get it, um, because you know any relationship is a two-way street, right? It's just not us doing their part. They're doing their part as well, because they want to connect with their teachers and their administrators. They want to build this thing called community, and they do a really good job at it. So that's kind of why all this works. Thank you. Robin, go ahead. Oh, thanks. Um, I, I just want to say um, I, just, I appreciate the explanations um, from the admin. I do think, I agree with Mary. Obviously, it's not a conversation for tonight, but I think sometime in the future, <clears throat> if detentions could maybe be looked at, there is some research out there that shows that detentions aren't as effective as we would like them to be um and i know you're you know you're saying you don't give out a lot of detentions and things like that which is great um and you have conversations and things like that but there are probably some repeat offenders and, and things like that that um i think in the future maybe some discussion around some uh different ways uh just could be helpful thanks thank you bravo Go ahead, um, thank you guys for coming out and talking to us all about this. Um, a couple of thoughts. Um, first off, I love that you included this section about final thoughts here um, and how you talk there about context, about um, learning experiences, how you talk there about restorative justice. That's all excellent language and, and it's very possible this already exists at the front of the handbook i'm not gonna lie it's been a while since i looked at the sure. very introduction sure. to the handbook if it doesn't i think it would be very well suited to the introduction to the handbook as a reminder to everybody who's looking at it that these are the the ways that things are approached um <coughs> i think that's it's it's very important language yep. um and it's it's very well written um obviously some part of it is directed specifically at us um, but the sections that talk about how discretion is used and all of these other things are, are, are important language and important things for community members to know um, as they move forward there's an opening there's an open there's a page where there's an opening letter from me Perfect. and I kind of update that every year so I'll make sure I'll go back and read it and make sure that I kind of capture that it says things like that but mm -hmm. I, I think it's worth revisiting yeah absolutely I think that's really well done and then and then just I agree with you with what you're talking about with detentions, a, a, a word in favor of detentions um, as a person who sometimes gives them. Um, that for me, um, a detention means something has happened that we need to address. We need to have a conversation. We need to figure out what went wrong. We need to figure out how we're going to move forward. We need to figure out what we can do to fix it. And so I think that's part of what I love about this language is it speaks really well to the purpose of 
some of the things that come up as consequences. They're not meant to be, like you said, just here's your consequence. They're meant to be a learning experience. Let's figure out what went wrong. Let's figure out how we can fix it. We're going to have some conversations together and we're going to chart the path moving forward is a really valuable thing for kids. But thank you for putting all this together. Appreciate it. Any other comments or questions? All right, we have a recommended motion. I move that the school committee approve the Longmeadow High School student handbook changes for 2022-2023 as presented. Should we say as revised? Yeah, I'm wondering There's about the same revision. as revised because that had that. So as yeah. revised. Okay. Is as there, revised. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? All right. We'll move to a vote. Nicole? Yes. Mary? Yes. Gianna? Yes. Susie? Yes. Bronwyn? Bronwyn? I said yes. I don't know. You heard me. <laughs> I heard Susie. I didn't hear Bronwyn. Oh, I didn't hear you call me. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you, Bronwyn. Jamie? Yes. And yes from me. Thank you for all your hard work. Thank you all. Thank uh, you so much. Yeah. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you, guys. I know you guys are going to come back next year, Paul. Night. <laughs> 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 the chair emeritus. <laughs> the chair emeritus. Thanks so much. We appreciate it. Good Thank night. you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, I'll take that under advice. Uh, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, administrator reports. Marty, you're up. Uh, I'll be brief. We have a few agenda items in front of us tonight. Um, thanks to Jim Layden, the Adult Center Director, for uh, helping us put together the Senior Citizen Luncheon and Concert. Uh, we had 75 seniors uh, registered. I counted about 50 who were able to show up, and so it was a really great turnout. First time in a few years that we've been able to offer that program, uh, and, and uh, we treated them to lunch following the concert. And uh, around the cafeteria, and had some great conversations with some of our seniors, and, and uh, they were most appreciative. And one gave me a cookie, so that was nice. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, Tom, did you get a cookie? I didn't get any cookies. <laughs> <Hang on. laughs> From Tom. <laughs> Uh, seniors last day tomorrow, the other seniors, uh, Long Meadow High seniors last day tomorrow. Um, our admin team uh, had a debrief meeting with the team from Challenge Success to uh, have a first review of the uh, survey results from Challenge Success. So uh, we have another meeting with them coming up uh, Thursday. Thursday. So we'll begin to think about how to um, share and use that, that information that we gathered from that survey how to use it um, for strategic planning and how to make it available to the to the wider community. So um, stay tuned. And uh, I think that's about it. We have uh, a new technology director uh, starting June 13th. I might have said 15th in my report to you. It's June 13th. Uh, Kim Florek is coming to us from Hampshire Regional, where she's been the technology director there since 2004. So. Uh, we're excited to get her on board and maybe she can help me run Zoom meetings. <laughs> so. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, any questions for Marty? All right. Thanks, Marty. All right. Uh, we have no assistant superintendent reports. So then to me, I have two quick things. Um, schools match wits, the final, Saturday, 7 o'clock. <laughs> Be there. Um, so yeah, don't forget about that. Uh, good luck to our, our students in that. And then the other one is just a reminder, we have an election upcoming on June 14th. If you are not able to vote on June 14th, go online, request an absentee ballot. Um, yeah, we want to make sure everybody who wants to vote is able to vote, so please do that. Uh, that's all for me. Dagan. Of course. So the first thing I have for you is our upcoming concert is the spring concert tomorrow here at 7:30. Um, all of yes, yeah, spring concert which means all of the groups in the music department will be performing. Um, it's one of my last concerts. A lot. It is our last concert for our seniors. So I, would, I invite you all to please come and enjoy some awesome music with all of our ensembles. 
And then the last piece I have for you, like just as Mr. Shea said, there is an election coming up at the LHS side of things. Um, I am in a contested election, so there is a possibility that this is my last report to all of you. So I'd like to thank you all, if I haven't done it already, very much for this year. Um, as my term is, is my first term, hopefully, second term coming around, as student to the school committee representative. Um, I've learned a lot on procedure and policy and in you know how I'm to speak in front of a, a an actual legislative assembly which I, I know will serve me in my future hopefully in Congress and, uh, and other places or as law school to Congress and anything where I go and thank you from the bottom of my heart for teaching me so much even if you guys don't think you did you definitely taught me a lot from all of you from Mr. Gantis to thank you answering all of my emails with all of my questions <laughs> <laughs> to any of the, the committee members who have asked me about what's going on at LHS what, from a student level or my personal level it means a lot so thank you very much and that is all I have to report at this time thank you Dagan we know that this is a uh, not an easy job and <laughs> you, you end up being here for a long time so <laughs> yeah. thank you all right, uh, we move to other reports, LPVC. Can, sorry. Yes. Can, can we all just, thank you, Dagan. We, you know, I, we don't know, but from me anyway, just, you're awesome, so thank you. Thank you. I don't know if you can give them a little. Sure. Sorry. Yeah. sorry, Kevin. No, thank you. It's all good. And we got virtual applause up there, too. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Ron. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Susan. <laughs> um, Mary, LPVC. Uh, yes, um, we did meet. I'll keep it brief. Um, so we've had a few presentations of folks who work um, for LPVC where they kind of give us some insight into their jobs. And it's actually been really helpful to understand the structure of how everything is set up. So this past week, Erin Duchesne spoke. She's the director of municipal reimbursement. Um, and she talked about her role, which is to access federal money to offset services received at schools um, uh, for you know students with disabilities. And it, it was actually very interesting and a, a tremendous job. There's money available for this, but it's very time consuming to actually apply for the money and she spends a lot of time. I appreciate that LPVEC is always essentially proving to the districts, that the member districts, that we are seeking all available reimbursements for you know everything that we are potentially eligible for. And she spoke a lot about that. Um, Karina Monroe um, is the curriculum director. She also presented. Um, we did end up, uh, or LPVEC did end up um, purchasing some real estate in Agawam. I know I've talked about this a few times uh, for where they're going to house their buses it still needs it's still in, in process um, buses cannot yet be parked there um, but that will be on the horizon um, and then you know I've gotten to know the other committee members through the meetings um, they're all virtual I don't see them ever in actual real life but um, the the man Bill Fonseca who's the chair um, is not running for re-election for East Longmeadow School Committee um, so I feel like I know him, but I don't actually know him in person. I just know him through these meetings. But it was a very um, nice, um, you know, kind of tipping your hat to this person who has been on the East Longmeadow School Committee for um, 16 years and during that entire tenure has also been on the LPBEC board. Yeah. So um, just a really uh, good guy. Um, led very efficient meetings which was nice <laughs> um, and so uh, so it was a nice uh, meeting I believe he'll be at the next one and there'll be a little bit of a restructuring um, you know of, of the board so thank excellent you. thank you um, energy and sustainability just a couple of quick updates um, one thing that that we talked about is the Pioneer Valley Planning Committee uh, is going to work with the town on figuring out what our greenhouse gas emissions are uh, to get a baseline and we need that because the state has committed to reducing greenhouse gas emissions and you will all know that the schools, <laughs> especially our buildings, um, are some of the, the leaders in greenhouse gas emissions when we heat them and cool them. So uh, that's something that we'll be hearing more about in the future. Um, and then the other thing is is the 
committee is working really hard to encourage people to use the mass save program to do energy audits of their houses. And so for anybody on the committee or anybody listening, if you haven't done a mass save audit ever, please do one. Uh, if you have done one, but it's been a while, please do another one. Um, and just a reminder, the committee really wants to remind people like this is your money. When you pay your gas bill, your electric bill, a portion of it goes to mass save. It is your money. So okay. yeah, and you can get a bunch of, of stuff that's really useful in your house. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, please use Mass Save. It will help all of us and it will save you money. It's a win for everyone. Okay, that's all I have for that. Um, Gianna, SEAL. SEAL, so Special Education Alliance of Longmeadow. Our last meeting is tomorrow. It's a workshop. Uh, go to SEAL, S E A L M A dot org and look for information. Uh, it is tomorrow night virtual um, at 7 p.m. Thank you. Thank you, Gianna. I'm assuming you do not have a task tax ceiling update, okay. Um, all right, on to our next agenda item, which is subcommittee reports. The only subcommittee up is the evaluation subcommittee. Um, Bronwyn, do you wanna take this one? Um, I'll just start off by saying um, that uh, we appreciate everybody's um, getting their evaluations in, and they're very thoughtful and um, had a lot of information and evidence that we were able to use when we were uh, synthesizing it for um, one evaluation for the superintendent. So everyone's will still appear as a public document, but um, it's just that it ends up as uh, we can utilize everyone's and make one, um, one document and Sorry we didn't get it to you earlier. We weren't able to meet on Friday due to COVID, so we had to meet on um, Monday. But Susie is actually gonna present um, the superintendent's evaluation for us. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. I, I realized, we also realized that one item was not in the folder, and our apologies for that. Um, but I'm going to share it on the screen so you can see it. Um, and just let me know if you can see it. Yes, we, for we the can see it. At home. Yep. Can everybody see the screen? It looks like a spreadsheet. Yes. Yep. Just a little bigger. Yeah, a little bigger. Okay, yes, I will make it bigger. Thanks. But as long as it's a spreadsheet, and I'm working on two screens, as long as it's the right screen. Um, so yeah, so the first thing we do is we take all of the ratings of each of the committee members and we create uh, one rating for each area. Um, and we do it with math and we create an average. Um, so as you can see, um, with the distribution of the ratings for each, um, for the professional goals, it's out of five. Um, so we assign a value to each of those. So um, the first, uh, the first one, and I don't have it in front of me, forgive me, but it's it's zero through four. Actually, we don't go up to five. We actually go from zero to four, um, and so that's uh, where this landed. So as you see, um, there was a three point four two overall score on goal one. Uh, which was proficient, a 2.85, um, 2.86 actually on uh, goals two and three, which also landed as uh, proficient for all of the goal areas that um, Marty presented on during the last meeting. And similarly, there's a four point uh, rubric associated with each of the professional practice standards, specifically instructional leadership management and operations, family, community engagement, and professional culture. Um, and as you can see, um, Dr. O'Shea also, um, from an average perspective um, across the committee, landed in the proficient category for all of those as well. Notably, as you can see, and again, this can be added to the document, there were um, individual committee members who, um, you know, had, had ratings at, at exemplary, but we always take an average for the final, um, final report, final, the summative uh, evaluation. Any questions about that before I move forward? Okay. And all of you should have the document um, the final 
subcommittee document that is included that was included in your packet and I think I have the right one open here I have page two of things open let's see the right one Yes, they all should be the right one. Okay. Um, for the purposes of structuring the um, the actual comments, um, because the um, superintendent's evaluation is really based on the goals, and that was his reflection. Um, his reflection was on the goals. We found and have done in previous years. We found it was um, helpful to actually focus on the in the actual um, standards of professional practice, specifically instructional leadership, management and operations, family and community engagement, and professional culture. So, um, for the purposes of the record, really, I'm going to read um, these, and we've broken them down into commendations and recommendations. And again. All of these uh, commendations and recommendations were lifted in part from some or all of the um, documents. If we found themes throughout each of the documents, then we just lifted one <laughs> sentence that might look familiar to you, and we made some uh, changes based on, um, you know, saying we instead of I, things like that. Um, and it's just it just helps to put together a coherent. Um, document because it's hard as you can imagine to take seven people's individual writings and make it into one uh, coherent um, and really uh, helpful um, report that the superintendent can walk away with not only what um, he did well but what he can also work on for next year um, so as we go through um, and start with instructional leadership our commendations are that Dr. O'Shea has worked to support educators with professional development focused on the tenets of MTSS and universal design. Additionally, he has demonstrated leadership with the development of the renewed vision of the graduate and the integration of this vision into the school community, the focus on equity and inclusion in programming, professional development and community events, and the successful growth of the innovative Long Meadow High School internship program that allows new pathways to success for LPS students. Lastly, Dr. O'Shea worked with multiple community stakeholders to gather and assess data on student learning that continues to be used to inform district goals and improve teaching and learning across the district. Recommendations. Moving into next year, the committee encourages Dr. O'Shea to utilize continued professional collaboration student and community feedback, and the newly designed protocols for learning walks to move forward with the equity review of the program of studies, as well as the other common goals in the vision of the graduate and the district improvement plan. Additionally, as gaps continue to increase due to the disruption that COVID continues to perpetuate, given CDC guidelines for isolation that cause multiple days of this school, it is imperative to ensure that all students are served within the MCSS model, including those learners who are exceeding or have advanced past grade level learning standards. In the management and operations area, and I don't know, do we want to go one by one and get comments, or do we want to kind of read them all and then get comments and questions? Maybe just go okay. through it all at once, Susie, if that's okay. One by one? Okay. No, I said go through it, go through it all. Oh, go through it all. Yeah. Got yeah. It. Okay. Management and operations, uh, commendations. Dr. O'Shea is to be commended on his management of school operations amidst the continued presence of COVID, especially with regard to implementing the test and stay program, phasing out mitigation strategies that may have deeply affected student mental health, and keeping the community school committee informed about concerning case trends. He is also to be commended for his continued advocacy for and the proactive steps taken to secure the involvement of the MSBA and finally accepting the FOI proposals for addressing middle school facility needs. <laughs> we also wish to highlight his efforts to respond to the horrific tragedy associated with the loss of an LHS student in May. His coordination, attention to the needs of students, and keen awareness of the impact this tragedy has had on the learners and community of Longmeadow were exceptional. Recommendations in this area, 
Given the last two years of significant disruption in the Longmeadow Public Schools, it is recommended that Dr. O'Shea implement a revised approach to management and operations moving forward, paying specific attention to the longer view of achieving district goals and what resources and plans need to be carried out to make them happen. Two possible avenues for this might look like either, one, integrating management and operations implications within the context of each of the professional goals and district improvement plans, or two, identifying a strategic plan specifically around management and operations. Examples of this might include aligning curricular and instructional goals with actual day-to-day -day delivery, such as the revision of school schedules and the procurement of new curricular materials, including textbooks or full programs. Similarly, considering the long-term needs of a viable athletic program, will ensure that outside variables do not hinder the proper functioning of that program. Given Dr. O'Shea's success in leading strategic change instructionally, we are confident in his ability to lead his team to focus on this aspect of operational improvement and sustainability. Family and community engagement, commendations. Dr. O'Shea is open and communicative with families in the community, both in public meetings and email message correspondence seeking engagement from the community on a wide range of issues. He also maintained regular communication with community members regarding the evolving COVID transmission rates, DESE guidance, and health protocols. Further, in a time of tragedy and sorrow, he worked alongside LPS educators to create genuine space for grief, not as an isolating experience, but as a communal one. The phrase, eyes on the child, shown through clearly, and the level of communication and care provided throughout has been remarkable. Recommendations. The committee recommends for Dr. O'Shea to continue evaluating how best to meet the challenge of engaging the wider community on news, updates, and community concerns, particularly in the face of growing political and cultural conflict in the wider world. Community events such as the Ron Jones event on civil discourse are a wonderful way to engage the community in productive discussions and goal setting that brings many on board. Continuing to promote the numerous offerings our school district provides to learners via his administrative team is also a highly recommended goal moving forward. Professional culture. Commendations. Dr. O'Shea has led stakeholders in the development of a comprehensive three-year district improvement plan, supported the implementation of a renewed vision of student success, provided the opportunity for schools to showcase how the vision of the graduate is embedded into the culture of their schools, and laid the groundwork to align district culture and practice with MTSS and UDL, Universal Design for Learning. Further, with a nationwide teacher shortage due to a period of challenge and burnout like no other in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, the superintendent has responded with empathy, compassion, and support. Whether through collective bargaining discussions and or advocacy for educator needs during school committee meetings, his support from Longmeadow educators and staff is unwavering. He is to be commended for engaging his administrative team in the first ever learning walks that will hopefully build an expectation that it is only by observing and understanding the classroom experience for learners that the district can promote and ensure the integration of vision of the graduate competencies throughout pre-K through 12. It is noteworthy that he administered the challenge success survey of student experiences in grades six through 12 for the first time this year as this data will lay a foundation for educators and leaders to respond to the current challenges facing long metal learners as they seek to build skills and knowledge for their futures. Recommendations. It is recommended that Dr. O'Shea continues to build a professional culture that emphasizes the importance of collective educator and leader capacity building through observation, analysis, and building coherence around the student experience. We strongly recommend that the LPS administrative team continue to implement and iterate the learning walks practice to build a culture of capacity building through continued, frequent, and inclusive classroom observation practices intended to support educators in building skills that respond to the needs of learners. It is only through this continued coherence building and collective understanding of both the best practices and desired outcomes of student-centered instruction that administrators and educators can truly make progress for meeting the goals for learning we've established for LPS students. And with that is the um, compilation of the um, shared information that was brought forward by the school committee.
Thank you, Susie. Um, before we get to comments and questions, I, I just want to thank uh, Bronwyn, Jamie, and Susie for all their hard work uh, to put this together. Thanks, thank you to the three of you. you guys did a lot of work, um, and thank you so much for for doing that. And Susie, thank you for presenting it. Um, comments, questions from the committee about the evaluation. Yeah. I was really just going to say thank you to y'all for doing, uh, you know, reading through all of them. That that was a lot of work that y'all did. So thank you for doing it so thoughtfully and and with you know with the the purpose the way that you did it too with the commendations and the recommendations so thank you for that okay. absolutely thank you marty sure you yeah. like uh, thank you comment. no I, thank you I, uh, <laughs> I appreciate it um i i i too would would commend the entire committee for um for putting together very thoughtful individual evaluations and the evaluation subcommittee uh, for for thoroughly and thoughtfully taking that information and synthesizing it, it it's it's hard to uh, take seven different evaluations and, and create a synthesized document but I thought they did a great job of kind of representing not only the feedback from the committee but also even um, some of the reflections that I had the opportunity to share with the whole committee so I it, the process felt uh, very thorough, very collaborative. So I appreciate everybody's effort on that. And then, you know, it, it similar to last year's evaluation, it, it provides a, a clear path for me. It, it, it's it's you know a clear um, clear signal to you know what what the expectations are going forward. So so thank you for that. Um, it's it's uh, it's interesting being evaluated in public, but uh, <laughs> knowing you know it's it's it feels good knowing that um, the committee approached it so thoroughly and thoughtfully, and you know frankly didn't shy away from offering some um, very specific recommendations, which are ultimately helpful. So thank you. Yeah. We have a recommended motion. I move on the recommendation of the evaluation subcommittee that okay. the school committee approve the summative unified evaluation of the superintendent for 2021-2022 as presented and authorize the chair to sign. Is there a second? Second. Discussion. Gianna. Uh, I was just going to thank superintendent. I was just going to thank you, you know, for your, you know, for everything that you do, but also you always answer my calls, you always answer my texts. <laughs> crazy as sometimes they may be and um, and even you know doing the one-on-one -on -one, you know how I'm about evidence collecting and yeah. you know I collect all year long and I'm taking notes and I got all my little in my head and observations but um, you know when you help me go through the, the you know that whole full form and I'm able to I, I really value yeah. evidence and so I appreciate when you are able to you, know, you give us your reflections or your updates or your emails or any yeah. way that you communicate but um that i just want to say thank yeah you. and and so much thank you and and those you know those um conversations are really helpful to me because they you know it's it's actually to go through the process and take stock of what we've done and i say we because you know frankly you know I, i'm not the one doing the work of the district I'm, I'm leading the work of the district i'm shaping it um but ultimately it's the administrators sue tom gene um and all the all the principals uh, all the assistant principals and of course all the educators and staff at the at the building level who are who are making all this stuff happen so um i hope it i hope that it it reflects you know some top to bottom integration of of of, of practice that that's really important to me so thank you yeah. susie go ahead yeah, Marty, I, um, when you said it's, it's very, it's, it's, it's a weird thing to be um, evaluated in public, and I've had the same um, pleasure that, <laughs> that, you're, that you're going through uh, for a few years as well. So, but I wanted to just say, um, if there were, you know, the last two years in particular, um, your job and your responsibilities for um, the most part, especially with COVID, have been a moving target. Um, and I think it's it's important to um, really kind of identify the fact that despite <laughs> that continuous moving target, um, a lot of really solid progress was made. And 
um, I, I think it's it's just um, important to highlight that, and, and you highlighted that in your in your reflection. And I think um, over the over the period of the last three years, in particular, um, I've just seen um, you know incredible growth in just in this process um, from you. So thank you for that, and thank you for um, being a collaborator in this, a really um, good collaborator in this process. Thank well. you. Appreciate that. Thank you, Susie. Other comments? All right, we will move to a vote. Nicole? Yes. Mary? Yes. Gianna? Yes. Susie? Yes. Bronwyn? Yes. Jamie? <coughs> Jamie? I didn't hear my name, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the owl. Um, yeah, and yes for me. Uh, thank you, everyone. All right, moving forward, we have some new business, end of year transfer authority. Tom. Yes, thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Tonight we would be asking the school committee to approve um, or provide authorization to the superintendent to approve end of year transfers. Uh, we usually seek this approval around this time every year. It provides for uh, us to make timely transfers of line items that may have a deficit as we are approaching the end of the fiscal year and as final uh, account, pay account payable warrants and uh, payrolls are posted to address any shortfalls that exist in any line item. It, the transfers would be done in accordance with policy DBJA, which is in your policy, but it sets out criteria for if a deficit is 10% of the budgeted amount and at least $1,000, or if the deficit is over $10,000, then it would trigger that a transfer has to be done to address that shortfall in that line. Um, and this is, like I said, a, a, an annual approval that we seek from school committee to assist with the closing of the books at, after June 30th. All right, we have a recommended motion. I move that as specified in school committee policy DBJA that the school committee grant authority to the superintendent to approve the necessary budget transfers between munis budgetary lines in order to close the fiscal year 2022 accounts. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All right, we'll move to a vote. Nicole? Yes. Mary? Yes. Gianna? Yes. Bronwyn? Yes. Jamie? Yes. Susie? Yes. And yes for me. All right. We are now to the executive session portion, and we have a recommended motion. I move that the school committee meet in executive session pursuant to Mass General Law, Chapter 30A, Section 21. A, purpose, two, to conduct a strategy session in preparation with collective bargaining with units A, B, C, D, non-collective bargaining personnel, and purpose seven, consideration of release of executive session minutes of previous meetings to reconvene into open session. Is there a second? Second. And again, just to make sure everybody's clear, executive session, and then we come back out into open session. Uh, any discussion? All right, we will vote. Nicole? Yes. Mary? Yes. Gianna? Yes. Bronwyn? Yes. Jamie? Yes. Susie? Yes. And yes for me. So we are now in executive session and we will come back out into open session at some point. <laughs> Thanks, everyone.
would like to welcome everybody back to the school committee meeting. Uh, we are back into open session and we have a recommended motion. I move that the school committee approve the memorandum of agreement with the Longmeadow Education Association Unit A dated May 11th, 2022 regarding coverage for LHS World Language and authorize the chair to sign. Do we have a second? Second. Any discussion? All right, we'll vote. Nicole? Yes. Mary? Yes. Jamie? Yes. Bronwyn? Yes. Susie? Yes. And yes for me. We have another possible motion. I move that the school committee approve the contract amendments regarding vacation days 2021-2022 for Dr. M. Martin O'Shea, Mr. Tom Mazza, Ms. Susan Bertrand, and Ms. Jean Fontaine as presented and authorize the chair to sign. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? We will vote. Nicole? Yes. Mary? Yes. Jamie? Yes. Bronwyn? Yes. Susie? Yes. And yes for me. I would welcome a motion to adjourn. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? My only discussion is that this committee has one more meeting, um, June 7th, and then it will be the new committee on June 21st. Uh, so yeah, just a reminder. We'll be back together one more time. Um, we will move to vote. Nicole? Yes. Mary? Yes. Jamie? Yes. Bronwyn? Yes. Susie? Yes. And yes from me. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you in two weeks. Good night.